Thomas P. Kelly from the DRV chair. If you are a Zoom participant, please sign in with your name on the participant toolbar. This is a hybrid meeting taking place at Town Hall or virtually on Zoom. All members of the board and public can communicate in real time. Planning staff will provide Zoom instructions for public participation before we begin. All votes taken in the meeting will be done by roll call vote and accordance with the law. If Zoom crashes, the meeting will be continued to November 22nd, 2022. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance of DRB members participating tonight. Paul Christensen. Present. Present. Uh, Paul, can you acknowledge that you're participating, can, please? Can you hear me now? How about now? Hello? Well, we can hear you. I just don't hear you. Okay. Okay. Paul, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Sean Hamilton. Scott Riley. Uh, Dave Turner is absent. Uh, Nate Andrews is here. And I'm present. So we have five ERB members. We do have a forum. Uh, next up on the agenda is the public forum. Opportunity for anyone to address the board on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, so if you're here present in the room, you can uh, raise your hand if you are participating by Zoom. You can take it for virtual. So we have no, no raise hand. Okay, thank you, Simon. Okay, now we go into the public hearing portion of tonight. Uh, we have a number of items on the agenda. Uh, 21 18, uh, which is uh, the annex, the request for road management. 23 03, uh, which is a two law subdivision. 24 04, uh, which is a two law subdivision at the Create One New Dwelling. 23 05 uh, is a pre app for two twenty five thousand square foot commercial industrial building and the Nobar subdivision. And then uh, we have 1823 uh, which is a created permit for continued operation of uh, own business. So first up is 1821-18. Uh, that's the annex who is here representing the applicant. Chris, just for the record, please state your name and address. Okay. 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 So, right. Has this is the twenty-one dash eighteen. It is a request for the application review um, for a mechanic to participate in growth management in March twenty twenty-two. The sole purpose of this application is to meet the requirements of WDB eleven point four point one that the project have pre-application approval from the DRB to move forward to growth management review. Uh, no site plan changes or any elements are being proposed to change. This is just um, an authorization to participate in growth management in March of 2023. Uh, the annex has received um, a portion of their allocation to date, and they would be looking for 67.5 BV in that time of site plan. Right. Okay. Uh, Chris, this is pretty straightforward. Anything to add to the staff report? No. Okay, thank you. ERP members. Any questions for staff or for the applicant? No. 
<laughs> this 100% of the rest of the budget. Yeah, we're going to be at page three. Yeah, uh, the count is we got one. So there's 241 dwelling unit equivalents proposed as 220, 276 actual units. There are some more veterans. But, um, last year they received 172.5 dwelling as 28 affordable, 146.5 market. So they would be looking for the remaining 67.5 market. Because of the allocation rules, they might not be able to get all 67 in March 2023 and need to come back in the year. But that's the remaining portion. And that's what we're doing three out of one tonight. Yes, yeah, letting them get to have the green lights at the end of March. And that's because over the 10 year span, right? Right. So, this is, this is not a review of. Yeah, I can I just everyone speak in time? We just make sure we speak up. Uh, so this is not to reopen and review the site plan, or it's strictly to advance the project to approach management. So, uh, DRB members, any further questions? No. Okay, members of the public, any questions? Uh, there's no raised hands. Okay. Uh, I am going to close DP 21 18 at 7 10. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is DP 23 03, which is a pre app for Michael and Sarah O'Leary Burke. It's for a two lot residential subdivision, a 10.1 acre parcel, a one new dwelling unit at 98 Snowdrift Lane in the Ag Rural Residential Zoning District. Uh, who is here for representing the applicant? You can state your name and address, please, for the record. Graham, uh, earlier. Brian Courier, Larry Burke. Hey, how are you, Brian? Good. Okay, uh, staff goes next. Uh, that's me. Um, so, this is a request for the application of the deal with the two lost subdivision of the Snowdrift Lane to create one new dwelling uh, in the agricultural rural residential zone. Uh, staff is recommending the new state testimony and close the deal tonight. Uh, deliberate and approve the application to allow it to move forward. Did uh, not see any comment letters. Uh, in terms of uh, dimensional standards, uh, both lots will be lot sizes, uh, and both lots will have the advantage of the subject plan. It's worth noting that Okay, pick up where I left off. Uh, it's worth noting that the parcel is less than 10.5 meters, and therefore the project is not required to be checked open space as a condition of the um, If the DRB opts to move this application forward to growth management, it will be third in October 23. Um, the project is not there to support the line of subdivision section uh, because the base area is 10 meters. 
that's what I do need to have the minimum points for 30 points. Uh, we have included a recommendation for staff to meet uh, with the applicant to discuss the process. Um, access, uh, the viewing system lots of open access on the Snowdrift Lake, uh, which is a residential driveway. Uh, and you can see on that image there it connects onto Old Greenway Road, uh, which is compliant. Uh, our bylaws do limit the number of dwellings that the residential driveway can serve uh, to five. Uh, Snowdrift Lane currently serves four, so this new lot would be picked uh, driving on that line. Uh, language is uh, and then lastly, which is the recommendation, um, we are including a specific recommendation that at uh, discretionary planning stage, uh, the applicant to include documentation that they would like uh, to access on that project. Uh, landscape, which is the last way of landscape process, which is called the setback to the property. Um, we do in this district. Uh, prioritize uh, existing landscape. Uh, in this case, you can probably see from the uh, aerial shot there, uh, there's a lot of forest in that in the spot, um, because of the side and rear uh, of this can be cut on existing uh, uh, uh There will also be uh, landscape into the small element of content uh, filtering. Uh, recommending that the um that the way of requirements trees that our number of trees that are on the road at the moment which is near forest area. lastly um the proposal has been reviewed by the conservation commission. Um they have made some recommendations that we have to come to take care of that service system. Uh, also the extent of forest clearing the unity as far as possible and we did have a half acre uh established uh building and development proposal. Uh, so that's it. There are there are functions and recommendations uh with the better points uh about highlighting Okay, uh, have you read the proposed conditions of approval? Uh, do you have any exception to the proposed conditions? Yeah. Okay, do you have anything to add to uh, Simon's staff report? Uh, that was pretty thorough. I think the only thing I would mention is that we've done a little bit of two areas that are suitable for analysis. Okay, uh, DRB members, questions for the applicant? Paul, any questions? Yeah, the one question was, is uh, I noticed that the snowdrift lane just keeps going on sort of off the picture here. Is there a turnaround for the fire apparatus on the end of this uh, snowdrift lane or what? Uh, snowdrift lane continues on to one more home. In the back there on uh, lot three of the original subdivision. Uh, I don't know if there's <coughs> Oh, so there is a there's a so there's a property at loan at lot three? Yes. Okay, that's all I need to know then. Thank you. Okay, DRB members, any other questions? Okay, members of the public, any questions? Uh, yes, if you would please go to the table and identify your name and address, please. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I'm Carrie Cruz. I'm at, at uh, 291 Stonebridge. So I'm at Last House. Um, so I did have two questions, actually. Um, we recently, well, we bought the property at the end of Stonebridge a little over two years ago. And I remember at the time, the former owners were looking into possibly subdividing our property. 
And um, there were some issues I think that they had come up that I was curious about with regard to this. So issue one was the water supply in terms of well water and available water in that area. Um, my second question has to do with the actual road, which is proprietary to our house, is shared use by everyone. There is no turnaround and it's kind of a narrow road. And I remember also at the time two years ago, there was some talk about culverts and widening the road in order to put um, another subdivision on that, that main. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna turn that over to staff to, um, to answer both those questions. First is, has to do with the water supply. Uh, which is outside of the purview of the DRB, but staff can uh, can provide more detail uh, on that topic. And then the uh, second is the road uh, question that was just raised. Uh, so the the Western Development Bylaws uh, do contain a chapter on site infrastructure, uh, and as part of that chapter, we need to demonstrate that the condition um, groundwater is for development. I think that's comply with the non uh, water source. Uh, in terms of so, so let's just stop there. So, what what really that means is that um, water supply to this proposed residence is outside of the purview of the DRB. That's a state issue. It's going to have to meet criteria established by the state uh, before they would be able to occupy the structure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Question number two. Uh, so question number two was I think two part. So in terms of your point about uh, the land being required to um bylaws to require uh then at this question from the stage to provide documentation if they've got a right to connect onto that plan. Uh so they're gonna be looking to provide that as part of this question and plan. Uh secondly in relation to the point activity about um standards of the uh, guideline. Um so the the bylaws do set out of standards in terms of which uh passing places uh grade uh construction uh which I think the project plan does uh control this concept but I think the point we were making earlier was that at the moment it's a residential driveway. Um, so, the question is really if you get a unit in that line. So, after that, there will be a point of order to learn and support any other competition. Can you say that last time again? So, after, if this was approved, this is a question of how much money further subdivision would need upgrades to the plan. So once you go past five units, mm -hmm. the criteria for the road becomes more, it's, it's more robust. That's really what it is. Okay. It's a wider road. Okay. But with this house, it, can, it, it is the way it is. Correct. Okay. All right. That's Thank right. You. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, any other public comments on this application? I have a question here on the line. Uh, okay, if you would identify yourself and your address, please. Yeah, so this is Adam Smith. I live at uh, 163 Snowdrift Lane. We're directly across the street from the proposed property. Okay. Uh, welcome. What's your question? Uh, my question is more related to utilities. Uh, our current electric service um, is served off of that main line. I'm just kind of looking at the map right now. And there's a utility pole looks that we're served off of, I think in generally right where that property, where the new house is going to go up. So that's my first question. What's the plan for how that will work with my electric line coming to my house? And then my second question is related to the natural gas line that comes down our driveway. I assume, I haven't read all the details here, but I assume they're going to want to connect the natural gas line that, that kind of terminates right at my property. And just want to make sure that 
the size of that line will support this extra four bedroom house. Uh, okay, Simon, you want to give a give a run at those? We're really talking about utilities. Yeah, so I think this is this is not regulated by the other ones. Make sure that we use the, the routes down. Uh, so they'll need to comply with the requirements of the one gas uh, and green mountain power uh, and driving. So, so Adam, the bottom line is this body doesn't uh, doesn't have any influence over the utilities. That's going to be worked out with Green Mountain Power and Vermont Gas. Um, it's not an uncommon. It's, this is not a unique situation, and so um, both of those utilities will, um, you know, will will um, draw a conclusion uh, consistent with best practices and. Um, I mean, I can't speak for Vermont Gas, but they're they're not gonna they're not gonna do something that um, provides you with too little gas to support your house. Makes sense. So, we'll wait to, just wait to hear. It's uh, Vermont Electric Co-op is the electric providers over here on this side. So, I would hear from them, I guess, about plans for reconstructing the electric lines. Yeah, uh, you can always be proactive and reach out to them and uh, and understand what their timing is, uh, or you can wait to hear from them. That's your choice. Okay. I have one last question while we're here. Um, there is a lot of ledge up there directly across from my house, and I, I do kind of see some of that in there, but is there any plans for blasting for this foundation for this new house that's going in? Um, I'm looking at the driveway in a way that avoids a no there to hopefully avoid blasting. Our, our, our goal is definitely to avoid blasting. Okay. Uh, so, so staff, uh, in the event that, this is more out of curiosity, in the event that there was blasting required, um, what, uh, what do the regulations do in terms of uh, calling for surveys of existing structures um, for, um, you know, for documenting any any damage that might occur with uh, with adjacent properties due to blasting. How, how does that work? Nothing in the Willis and Marmot. No, so while Emily's right, there's there's nothing in Williston's bylaws specifically requiring things like pre-blast surveys. Those are standard practice for any blasting company. And our experience with other developments has been that blasting is required. Blasting company handles not only any blasting that's happening, but also the performing of pre-blast surveys and post-blast monitoring uh, in, in the area that is thought might be affected. Okay, so the, the takeaway, if I were a neighbor, is that um, if there is blasting that is required due to you only know what you know based on geotech, um, uh, I would um, pay attention to make sure that the, the, the pre-blast surveys are actually taking place. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, any last thoughts by the applicant? Okay, uh, I'm going to close DP 23 03 at 727. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Uh, DP 23-04, this is for a two-law subdivision uh, to create a new dwelling unit at 607 North Williston Road. Uh, who is here for the applicant? Brian Gerger, Larry Burke. Welcome, Larry Burke. Welcome. 
Uh, yeah. Yep, that's me. Uh, so this is another request for a presentation of you about two lots of describing residential zone districts. Uh, the proposal seeks to split the parcel at 607 North Western Road uh, to accommodate the recently constructed access to the in and Yellow Road. Uh, in association with this, there is a boundary line adjustment um, between 607 North Western and 55 East Bank Road. Um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 in terms of financial standards, um, here you can probably see the two options um, that we have been submitted. Uh, on the left there, uh, and then the applicant's preferred option one the uh, right here. Uh, both options sort of uh, retain six by seven on the phone lot, established the new lot, the NBU. Uh, in terms of uh, 55 East Bank Road, uh, in terms of uh, compliance with the dimensional standards, uh, 607 is anticipated to meet the dimensional standards, uh, a sufficient frontage, meet the lot size requirements, uh, and also meet the setbacks. Um, lot at 607, uh, sorry, the new lot with the ADU. Uh, is also anticipated to meet the um, dimensional requirements. Uh, it can meet the lot size, it has the frontage on the east bank drive, uh, and subject to uh, resolving the minor discrepancy uh, on option 1A to meet the uh, setbacks. Uh, the actual recommendation is just to correct that minor discrepancy uh, on the rear setback line uh, if the application is to that particular lot. Uh, the, the last element is the um, boundary line adjustment and what that does in the dimensional standards for 55 East Bank Drive. Um, as you can see, there are two options. Option 1A, um, thanks to the um, access sort of on, on another lot separate from the main dwelling that does well, move the lot line so that it's shared uh, and this area required. By the way, now we sort of move on to 55 percent of our great say a 10 foot side setback with that property. Uh, uh, option two uh, is similar again, it, move, it moves a lot of lines so that um, the shed and the driveway are no longer on the mining property, uh, but it also uh, moves that property driveway. Onto the same lot. Uh, you end up with a, a slightly oddball shaped lot. Um, it's probably a, a more preferable uh, solution. It's much younger. Uh, the only thing we'd say about that, that option, and we've included a recommendation to that effect, is that the lot line should be tweaked uh, just to make sure that the, the minor incursion uh, into the side of the hack setback is resolved there. Uh, moving. Okay, so before yeah. you go on, uh, do you have any issue with that? That uh, if if uh, if we were to proceed and approve with one B, uh, that that caveat uh, that Simon just mentioned, do you have any issue with that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm not even sure what the, what that is. But I have, uh, have another concern. If we're being asked to review two different applications here, and I'd like to know which one we're reviewing. Uh, it's it's pre application stage at the moment. We do encourage people to submit different options. Uh, I think staff 
think the option one pays is better. I think the African thinks option one pays is better as well. Yeah, it's just it's just different options. All right. All right. And, and my understanding, yeah. if I could be a simpleton, one one B just puts the driveway on. It, it eliminates the need for a right away. Is that fair? Correct. Yeah, we submitted one A first, submitted one B afterwards. But since it's pre act, we were a patient with both options. Yeah. Our staff and us three one Bs with our options. All right. Yeah. All right. But that's that's it. Okay. 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 Yeah, there's, there's a strong preference from the <laughs> Great. It creates a flag yeah. with the uh, existing lot of existing uh, Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess then I would ask them, I don't understand what the minor adjustment would be. But I'm pretty often to see that I don't know. It's a uh, uh, this area here. Is uh, within the side setback. Uh, and driveway is going across the uh, setback of right angles. Uh, so it just needs to be tweaked uh, slightly uh, to move it out of the side setback. So that so that boundary line, which is which is south to north. Okay, we just have to be moved a little to the East, so that the existing driveway setback is compliant. Oh, I see. that's that's it, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, right. We can maintain the lot size, so we can move the rear line back. Just okay. so to make sure we keep the lot size. But yeah, not minor. So you got to you got to play with the lot size to be compliant yeah. with the setback, I guess and and still meet the minimum lot size. Yep, and the shed is close. So the reason we're yeah. doing the boundary lines, the shed is kind of the line, so we got to keep that setback in consideration. Okay. That makes sense, John? It does. Okay. I, you know, I just think it's it's important to meet the bylaw. Yeah. Right. 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 And uh, so it'll be incumbent upon you to do that uh, should this advance. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Simon, you were derailed. Okay. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Thank you. Just um, you've included a recommendation that they need to ask. Growth management, they are eligible for the mining unit subdivision. Uh, they've also already been granted water and sewer capacity. Uh, the ADU is still under construction, I understand. Uh, so we just include the recommendation uh, that they do uh, ask us to put an occupancy for um, securing their final plans. Uh, I think that was everything I wanted to draw to your attention. I know all recommendations and motions. Yeah. Okay, have you read the uh, proposed motion? Yeah. And do you have any concerns? I do not. Okay. Uh, DRB members, any further questions? Paul? Uh, yeah. <laughs> One question. Uh, if you were to take the lot line that creates the driveway as a really should, yeah, if you were to take that that one, the one on the the one on the left, if you were to just change that and instead of it cutting straight across, you basically made it. Uh, turn where it just paralleled the driveway down, wouldn't that give you more land in that proposed lot too than your secondary choice where you basically sort of cut off the rest of the backyard or two? You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, so it would be, it'd be a bigger lot, but then, then you'd have to have a right of way in the deed. And no, no, so what I, no, no. What I'm saying is, instead of cut, cutting the the first, the one on the left, instead of cutting it all the way across, if they just made a right hand turn when they got to the driveway and went out, the driveway would still belong to the lot in the back, 
and lot two would actually have more land than the secondary proposal where he basically sort of runs that he cuts the backyard of two off No. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't well, have, I, 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 I have any idea what he's talking about. No. I, I do, but I have to think that, that there's a couple of very qualified engineers here representing the client, um, and uh, there are probably issues that we're not really aware of. They okay. understand the bylaws, and I would assume that the next time you see this, that the, the lot size is the right size, the setbacks will be proper, and we'll uh, okay. we'll take a, take a go at it then. Okay, just ask the question. Never mind. Okay. No, thank you. Um, okay, members of the public, any questions? Yes, this is Judy Geisler. I'm a resident at 98 Keystone Drive. My concern is um, after the new dwelling was put in at 55 Keystone Drive, I would have expected the boundaries to be adjusted, evaluated before the structure at 55 Keystone went in. Why is it happening now? So, in, in answer to that, the, the, what, what you're saying is the new dwelling um, is what's called an accessory dwelling unit. So that means it's accessory to the main dwelling at uh, 607. So it's like a of a granny apartment or an in law apartment or something that, that is subsidiary to the main house. That, yep, the permits of that, they don't need to have their own lot. But what the applicant is now saying is they've built that, they would like to get like a certain lot and be a separate standalone home, uh, which is why it's been done in this order. So it becomes its own. So they're not anticipating further construction on the new lot that's being developed. Uh, there's no, there's no. I don't believe there's any representation as to future intent. So they're, they're in other words, they're silent on their plan for for future development on that lot, and they and they don't have to disclose. Uh, any development plans for the newly created lot at this stage? Is the newly created lot large enough to uh, to be able to accept another dwelling? Yeah. Yes, it is. Being that Keystone Drive is a private road, the dwellings off North Williston Road that access Keystone Drive, there is no contribution to the road maintenance at this point. Maybe that's something that we have to discuss with the short sleeves. Yeah, that, that would be something outside of the purview of the DRB. You are, you are correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other public comments? There's no other way to Okay, DRB members, uh, any last questions? Uh, applicant, any final words? No? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close CP 23 04 at 742. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is DP 23-05, uh, who is here representing the applicant. You don't have to move tonight, huh? 
All right. Uh, welcome, Brian. Uh, please help this, uh, Emily. Thank you. Would need to demonstrate that it complies with the standards of Chapter 18 
particularly if there's going to be anything like hazardous materials, light, glare, quality equipment, noise, um, or vibration that would be properly mitigated based on the uh, Landscaping, a uh, specific recommendation is included here, particularly requiring a type 3 buffer supplemented by a type 3 buffer and a fence along the property line with 253 type of This is an existing residential property. It is located in the industrial zoning district where residential is a non conforming use. However, it's currently occupied as a home. Um, the driveway wide pole width is also very important here. If it's 60 feet, as shown on the row bear plat, that's enough space to provide the driveway and the required buffers. Um, as well as there's an opportunity to shift the driveway as far west as possible to the side of the story and maximize the buffer space alongside the residential home. The DRB has some um, flexibility around giving a, a reduction if a fence is provided. So they could reduce the width of that 23 foot buffer to the seven quarter feet. Say that last piece again. So typically, the buffer width for a type of buffer is 23 feet, and there's a reduction allowed. If they provide a fence, they can reduce it up to 25%. 25% of 23 is 17.25. Okay, you said 27, that's bad. Right. Oh, my apologies. Sorry. Okay. Um, and street trees, typically street trees are required with 40 feet. Uh, so this might be one or two street trees where the driveway is not used on that road. Compliance is also anticipated with water for health standards. There is a wetland buffer on the property um, that will need to be delineated and shown on the plans. And they will also be required to provide Similarly, there's standard recommendations for outdoor landing, signs of public art, and impact fees. Uh, those can be addressed at discretionary permit, and impact fees are assessed at administrative permit. Thank you. Okay, so when I look at the recommendations that staff has made, I, I might be missing it, but I don't see anything about a sidewalk along the flagpole. Uh, the access road. Am I missing it? Um, you are not missing it. If, if that's something that the DRB would like, uh, it, it would be something that be added. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, uh, what's, Brian, what's your, what's your position on uh, a sidewalk along the uh, access road? We'd be okay tabling uh, that discussion at discretionary when we're a little more clear about the uses we're proposing. If it turns out to be primarily a warehouse, not a lot of employees, very little traffic production, you know, I think the sidewalk, especially at 600 feet, would be an added expense that I don't think will get used. It won't be found in the winter. Very, I think it, uh, the cost will not weigh the benefit of it. Now, if it turns into more of an office use where so there are a lot of employees, obviously we're not showing it on parking right now, um, you know, maybe, maybe it does make some sense. Uh, to include you know, the sidewalk. I think the, uh, the access road, we'll have input from the fire department, maybe at least 24, 25 foot wide. It's a very straight driveway, so the line of sight's not an issue. We have a sidewalk, we have to propose some sort of green belt, limiting how far we can shift the driveway away from the top. So uh, at this point in time, uh, we're okay tabling that discussion until you're more clear, or we're more clear on the use of the building. Uh, we'd rather not see a uh, conditional approval. I don't think it has any bearing on what you, what the use of the building is going to be. Okay. Yeah. Secondary, the second of the secondary use or the second use down the road is going could be an office space, and then a, then the sidewalk is not there. Okay. That was right where I was going to go. Is we don't know what who's going to occupy it. Sure. And it's, number it's two, very little three, being four. Shown, so that will limit what could go. In sure. The future. Yeah, to, to look at it a slightly different way, the, the cost benefit I think should take into account not not necessarily the financial aspect, but the fact that are we? I mean, a five foot sidewalk for six hundred feet is how many square 
feet of impervious area, and we're working very high roads and did not cave our town. And uh, we've got a very low uh, usage there. I would suggest it's possible that it's not worthwhile. So we'll have that discussion in delivery session. Yep. Uh, that's a uh, that that is a point well taken. Um, okay, it is a big stamp hit though. I would add, I would I would add that part. part. But if you say your car trips a day, it might be worth it thirty years. So we'll we'll have that discussion. Yeah, um, may I suggest the flexibility if the board was leaning toward a sidewalk and we consider a bike lane instead, or maybe a, a white stripe down. You know, down the drive or something associated with the width of pavement rather than a sidewalk uh, separate. Good suggestion. We'll uh, consider that. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so, ERB members, uh, questions? My, I guess my, my only this is not so much a comment and it's or it's a comment not so much a question and that is that it appears that you're maximizing the site um, for the buildings um, for the buildings on what you can squeeze in there and, and again this is a comment um, only that uh, it doesn't leave much room for expansion of parking and uh, you got barely enough for turning radiuses and it's going to be a tight site. Yeah, that's that. common. Nothing, yeah. nothing more. Yeah. Uh, other ERB members, questions, comments. I would, I would make a comment that uh, at EPA, I'd like to make sure that, that we see uh, kind of maximum uh, attention paid to the uh, the buffer next to the residential property. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if there's a fence, um, I'd like to make sure that the fence is actually like you know, separation. Yeah. And that will survive the test of time. Right. So I think, you know, I think a fence is, can be a very good thing there to reduce the that buffer. Yeah. yeah, and I believe the fence is that a, uh, a waiver or, or a uh, decision that the ERB has to enact, or maybe as a Condition we could see something that the DRB would support effects for reduction of the buffer. Um, can you can you say that a different way? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't quite follow that. Uh, as a condition, if the board would put something or a finding that they would support effects to reduce the landscaping buffer along the residential property, I believe that's something specific that the board has to look at. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Buffers would maybe reduce by the height of the fence if the board is provided. The height is not just for the fence. So the design would be with the people by the fence. So, so because there's standards, I don't think the DRB needs to weigh in on that. You, you can then make a decision. <laughs> And in, in your uh, discretionary permit, how you want to draw that? I, yeah, I was only commenting on my expectations for what that would look like. Yeah, as we discuss it, in the future, yeah. if it shows up. Yeah, and this 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 is not going to make it into a recommendation, but a conversation with the neighbor would probably be a good thing to do. Okay. Is 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 that neighbor here? I don't think so, but they did stop by the office. Okay, so I I would recommend that you uh, set up a, a you know a discussion um, and and get some feedback on preferences, maybe type of fencing material, things like that. Um, yeah. Just being a, a, a good a good <clears throat> reach out. Okay. Um, public, any feedback or comments?
And we have no, no raise plans on Zoom. Okay, DRB members, any last questions for Brian? Uh, just one. Um, proposed height of the building? We, we don't have elevations yet. The minimum uh, less than uh, 36. 36. Okay, anything else? Brian? I'm all set. You're good. Okay. okay. Uh, 7.58, we're going to close PP 23-05. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is AP 23-0062. Uh, this is a request for an administrative permit for continued operation of a nonprofit dog rescue panel contained within the garage and outdoor panel space in the backyard located at 170. Lamp Light Lane in the RZP. Uh, who is here representing the uh, homeowner? Hi, good evening. Uh, if you would state your name and I assume you're the resident. Okay, so just your name, please. Uh, good evening. Welcome. Uh, who's Matt? You've got this? Okay, so before you start, if you would please um, share with the DRB members and also the public um, what the DRB's responsibilities on this uh, on this discussion are. Sure. So, backing up a little bit, uh, Vermont state law limits the powers of zoning in the area of home business and generally states that um, municipalities within Vermont that have zoning shall not have their zoning have the effect of prohibiting a reasonable home business. Um, Williston, in response to that, has, adapt, has adopted um, Chapter 20 uh, and Appendix G into its Unified Development Bylaws, setting out limits and standards for permitting of home businesses. Um, these limits have to do with some of the impacts that home businesses might generate on their surroundings. Um, they say very little about the nature uh, of the business for profit or otherwise, um, or, or what the business does, but are rather focused on the impacts the business creates. So um, I'm not sure Pete, if I'm covering everything you want here, but um, Generally, we're dealing with an element of zoning where the standards are very much related to the integration of a, of a home business into a residential neighborhood as in this by state law. Okay, good. So, so when the DRB and I'll let I'll let Matt continue, and I know there's a lot of interest in this in this discussion tonight, and uh, and and people are going to have an opportunity to weigh in. But the DRB is um, part of our fundamental rule is protecting people's property owners' rights. And in this case, we have multiple property owners. You have existing residents um, who, um, who have rights, quiet enjoyment of their property. And then you have an existing homeowner that has rights to have a home business within some rules. And so our role is, is not to judge the merits of the business. I, I'm going to ask that people don't talk about their experience with getting a dog and, a, and how it changed their life and that type of thing. It's not germane to tonight's discussion. What is germane is rights within the rules that the DRB has to rule on. And, and so um, within that context, I ask people um, when, when they weigh in with their thoughts, if they keep their comments um, to property rights. 
And um, and if 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 anybody has any question on what I mean by that, um, when we get to the the public forum piece, um, you know, we can we can have some more discussion about that. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to your staff report, Matt. Thank you. All right. Um, so as it was called the uh, beginning of the agenda item, this is a request for a permit for the continued operation of a home business at 170 Lamplight Lane in the residential zoning district. This is a referral of an administrative permit application by the zoning administrator, uh, happens to be me, uh, to the DRB for discretionary permit review. And since this is a rather uncommon way for something to end up in front of the DRB, I just want to go over that. Um, as it's discussed in the staff report, uh, within the rules that the Williston Unified Development Bylaw has for home businesses, there is contained a provision that allows the administrator to refer a permit application for a home business to the DRB where the administrator believes the DRB would need to prove, approve an exception from the traffic generation standards um, that are contained within Chapter 20 and Appendix B. Trip generation uh, is something the DRB sees frequently when new businesses are proposed. We're often talking about something big, like a grocery store that might generate 80 trips during the evening peak hour. Or something like that. In the, in the case of a home business, the limit for administrative approval, depending on zoning districts, one or two PM peak hour trips. And I read the bylaw here as looking at vehicle trips as a proxy for the intensity of use that's happening as a result of the home business. And so most home businesses, and we probably approve half a dozen or 10 or so a year are handled administratively in our office. Um, many of them are home office type uses or um, some sort of a contractor who uses their home as the administrative center of their business but performs a lot of their work off site, et cetera, or your typical um, massage therapist, piano teacher, et cetera, uh, who, who has no employees and, and maybe has no one or very few people who visit the site. Where the work is visiting the home office. So in this case, uh, the description we we received um, this this process began as a complaint and a notice of zoning violation violation issued by me to the homeowner saying we think that what's happening here is the home business. We think it requires a permit. We then worked with the homeowner to receive the administrative permit and determine from there that what was being requested was likely to generate more vehicle trips in that you know, peak hour than could be permitted administratively. So why is this in front of the DRB? It's in front of the DRB because it's likely in any permissible form to be generating a few more vehicle trips than the one per uh, PM peak hour that could be approved administratively. Um, and as I said, I really believe that the way the bylaw is looking at vehicle trips here is it's about the number of trips, but it's really about the intensity of the activity of the business. And the rest of the staff report I'll go through talks about the different ways the home business checklist and appendix G, chapter 20, and chapter 18 are related to nuisance and or the impacts a home business might have on neighboring property. So, with that said, I'll just go through the basics. Uh, we're on a 0 0.46 acre lot. In a residential zoning district, the primary use of the lot is residential. There is a home enterprise or home business activity taking place today, so I'm not calling it a change of use, but this would be the first request for that use to become permanent. Um, there is no design review or conservation commission review or other advisory or review for this project. I've mentioned the relevant chapters again 18 compatibility, potential hazards, and nuisances, 20 residential improvements. Uh, there may be some discussion about the lighting here on the 24 uh, in Appendix G home business. So, tonight's recommended action is for the DRB to take testimony. Um, I, I wrote this fairly wide open as take testimony and continue, deliberate tonight, and possibly a future meeting and decision. Other, I made some notes. This is really up to the board. If, if you feel you have enough information to close tonight, that's fine. 
Uh, if you feel that after deliberating, you've you got enough information to make either uh, a denial or a condition of approval, that's fine too. Uh, but I didn't want the board to feel like I was presupposing your actions on something that might, might merit some significant discussion. This is the first time the DRB is reviewing this request, and I have provided a history on the top of the second page about the zoning violation and the home business permit request and then referral. Um, as well as the lack of, in this case, need for interdepartmental or community commission. Public comment. We had received 68 comment letters uh, by November 3rd. We received five additional letters after that. We have uploaded the letters to the mail on the council website. And so, Matt, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, so, those are all part of the public record. Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. We've, we've added anything to sense to the record as well. Okay. Um, and so that means those have been on the website and the DRB members have had those to review as well prior to this year. Um, just wanted to note under discretionary permit procedures, uh, we did receive several comment letters from folks who were not residents of Williston. That's okay. In our bylaw, all persons are free to offer oral or written testimony if they're conducted by the DRB. Um, but there are some rules in state law about who could appeal a DRB decision. So one reason that people participate in a DRB hearing is to gain what's called party status, meaning the right to participate in the proceedings should they proceed beyond the DRB uh, into an appeal to the state environmental court or beyond. Um, Part of being a party to something means that you've participated, um, but you, you need to both participate um, and also be able to show some connection to what's happening under the approval of the permit. So, quoted that language in the staff report about interested parties. Um, and as, as was discussed by the chair earlier, um, in our bylaws, we talk about our hearing procedures for spoken testimony to focus on statements that are to address the merits of the proposed development that demonstrated by its compliance or failure to comply with specific requirements of the bylaw. And that said, I'll talk through some of the requirements of the bylaw as they relate to this business. So chapter 20 in the Williston Unified Development Bylaw is um, a chapter about residential accessory uses and structures, and it contains the provisions related to home business. And as I mentioned before, this is in direct response to 24 BSA 4412, subsection 4, requiring that zoning bylaws allow for some reasonable use of a portion of a home for a home business. So uh, the first part is, what is a home business? Is it any commercial activity, whether for profit or not, conducted at a one or two person dwelling by the resident of that dwelling? Um, so. So, so that's a one or two household dwelling. One, right, one or two household dwelling. Okay. Sorry. So um, we have the homeowner conducting the business in the home, which is a one or two household dwelling. Uh, the, the business as described and proposed complies with that. Uh, we have a rule in Chapter 20 about a commercial vehicle being parked at the home. Um, the overnight parking of a commercial vehicle is 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight or more. Is a commercial activity and would be regulated as such in the residential district of town. Um, we don't see a proposal here for a vehicle of that size. Um, comment letters we received did mention a van um, that appears to be a passenger, uh, you know, minivan. Um, looking up a typical gross vehicle weights, to get to 10,000 pounds with a van, you're, you're looking at a relatively well equipped or low standard 15 passenger work van. So that's about where that threshold is. So staff believes that um, the proposal complies under 20.4.2 about commercial vehicles. Uh, is a permit required to establish a home business? Yes, that's uh, part of why we're here tonight. Um, and again, I mentioned the traffic thresholds of second bullet under 20.4.3, discretionary permit is required for all home businesses that are supposed to have more than one non-resident employee on site or generate more than one PM peak hour trip. Um, so we we understand from the description there's more than one person who visits the site uh, per day all here. 
um, and but it's likely that we're generating more than one PFD hour trip. That's why I refer this to the DRB for discretionary permit review and have not approved it. Um, so then, what standards apply to home business? And the bylaw refers to Appendix B. Um, I'll take us through the requirements of Appendix B. Um, it's worth noting that kennels, in particular, are mentioned in Chapter 20 as it relates to the conduct of home business. Um, again, states that a permit is required uh, for a kennel use for boarding and breeding um, can be permitted as part of home business. Um, standards for kennels, uh, again, an administrative permit should be, shall be approved where the administrator finds it complies with the standards of WDB 20.2 for accessory structures and 20.8 for fences. What that means is a kennel uh, is like a shed. It's an accessory structure. It's required to meet conventional requirements of the bylaw, which is typically uh, setbacks 15 feet from rear, 10 feet from the side, and either 25 or 50 feet from the front yard line, depending on the site. So um, those requirements would apply here. Uh, it's worth noting that the kennels shown in the application are under 10 feet in height and under 120 square feet in size. Each um, that exempts them from the general requirement for an accessory structure to have an administrative permit, but even structures that are exempt from the requirement for a permit are required to set that. That's something that you know you possibly discuss in terms of additional site planning or information they might require should they be considering an approval of the project. And moving on to the next page of the staff report. Um, to discuss the requirements in Appendix G of the bylaw. Um, and some of this is a restatement of what, what's in 20, but it does have a more information. So I'll go through it uh, one more thing at a time. Uh, the owner of the home business must be in residence. We understand that to be the case here. Um, how much space can be used for a home business? In the residential zoning district, 25% of the floor area of the dwelling or 500 square feet, whichever is smaller. We understand the finished floor area of the dwelling question to be 1,900 square feet. 25% of that would be 475 square feet. We would understand that to be the maximum. The applicant has provided a floor plan showing the indoor area um, in the garage of the dwelling that's in use for the business of 14 and a half by 20 feet, which is 290 square feet. With the added two kennels in the backyard, we come up with 470 square feet. Just under that 475 square foot. Is the 1900 square feet include the garage? No, it's the it's the calculated finished area of the house. Okay. So, so the garage is like a like is, a basement. It is would be like a a uh, a I don't know a secondary a secondary structure really in this in the way this is being looked at. You can treat it the same way. Yes. Okay. So we're basing it on a percentage of what's what's thought of as the home that's in residential use. Okay, got it. Um, can a home business have workspaces or store materials outdoors? Um, in the RZD where we are, the space used for proposed home business shall be within the dwelling or in an accessory structure that complies with all the requirements of the bylaw. Outdoor workspaces and outdoor storage of material supplies, equipment, vehicles, or goods for sale are prohibited. RZD, uh, as well as the mixed use residential and storage zone. So you'll note in my staff notes, uh, I know this as a decision from the DRB needed. Uh, I would encourage DRB to take some testimony on this question tonight. Um, you, you cannot have outdoor workspaces in storage, you can use accessory structures. So we have a, a use here that has kennels in the backyard. Um, I, I might read that to say that the kennels are accessory structures, W20.9 specifically allows their use as part of the home business. And what a part I put in bold is, however, the yard around the kennels could not be used as an outdoor workspace. Um, and the DRB should discuss what that means to them in the context of a dog rescue or dog boarding um, training operation. I, I would read it that it cannot be used as an outdoor workspace. Um, Related to the home business. Must a home business require parking? Yes, our uh, Appendix G does require off street parking. Uh, it says at a rate determined by the administrator or the DRB. 
where more than one additional parking space is required, the administrator or DRB may require that off street parking for a home business meet the location, side, or rear yard, and landscaping requirements that would apply in a commercial or industrial zoning district. So typically, when we have non residential parking, it may be subject to setback or landscape buffer screening requirements. Again, I know that this is a matter of the DRB. We need to make a decision on particularly if it's considering uh, an approval. Um, number one, to determine based on the intensity of use, what is the appropriate amount of off street parking to, re to require here? Uh, the existing driveway on the site is relatively small. My estimate is that it can accommodate maximum two vehicles. Uh, that would be two vehicles outside the front yard setback. Um, there does appear to be some physical space on the north side of the driveway where additional parking. Designated, and it would really be related to the ability of the home business to capture the parking demand from those volunteers during the day. And I'm sure the DRB has read a significant amount of testimony in preparation for this hearing about parking demand as generated by the use. We can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, are there restrictions on potential nuisances generated by home business? Yes, there are. Uh, this is this is where Chapter 18 of your bylaw comes into place. And, and in particular, we're discussing uh, F of that section, which is related to noise. Um, certainly, the barking of dogs can, can happen in a way that exceeds the noise limits, particularly if dogs are outdoors during the evening hours where the town's noise ordinance drops the threshold. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, further down in the staff report. Um, Number seven is about the ability for a home business to have a sign. Home businesses can have a sign. There is no sign for most here. So we've left it at that. Um, a restatement in number eight of the commercial um, vehicle size limit. Again, we do anticipate that a vehicle use in association with this business would comply with the standards of Appendix G. Lastly, uh, the discussion of restrictions on traffic generation of objects that numbered out. Of why um, I restated the requirements there about traffic generation. Um, the thought that that's part of why this is in front of the DRB. Um, and noted that we received significant public comment about traffic generation, uh, and in particular, traffic and parking generation in relation to how this property is situated. It is, a, it is at the, the top of a key intersection, um, the major entrance. House is located. So anybody anybody coming into the neighborhood from this street has to make either a 90 degree right or 90 degree left turn at the intersection that this house is on. Um, I, I have only been out there when there wasn't anybody street parked, but can imagine you know, a significant amount of street parking could make it a little tougher to uh, get through there. The second discussion of traffic impact gets into a, a particular activity. <laughs> That has been occurring at this business. And I'm, I'm referring to what are called transport days. These are events <laughs> where a significant number of animals are brought to the site uh, and generally met and adopted by families all on the same day. Um, if, again, as board members have read public comment, read about these events where a fairly significant number of folks are brought to the neighborhood um, in the space of a short amount of time. And there's really significant street parking happening throughout the neighborhood, and a lot of activity happening as a result of those days. Um, I've identified that as, as a component of the business that I do not believe uh, can be permitted as an ongoing uh, zoning permission for a home business. Uh, it appears to exceed some of the metrics that uh, either Chapter 20 or Tennessee sets out for home businesses. Um, and that said, in numbers one and two in this section, I've discussed two ways in which that component might still fit. Um, one is the town does have a temporary event permitting standard through an ordinance. This is specifically drafted for things that cannot be permitted in zoning. It's a, it's a one-off permit. It's limited in how many of them can be issued in a year, and it's entirely discretionary between select board members. Issue those. This would be the same permit that somebody could get if they wanted to host a neighborhood block party um, or uh, host a couple of weddings on their rural property during the summer, etc. 
uh, it's outside of zoning. Um, the other option, my number one, is for that particular activity to be held off-site. So I began some of my discussion tonight by talking about how some, in fact, a pretty significant number of home businesses we see, somebody is doing some of the business at their home, generally the office work, uh, in this case, arranging for the transport of dogs, arranging for their adoption, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're doing that work at home, but then that more intense activity is occurring off-site. So somebody who um, prepares cabinets for installation in the kitchen, they might have those cabinets in the garage for a while, they might work on them a little bit. But really, the big work is they're going to take them out of the stall somewhere. We might parallel with uh, that. So um, it's, it's, I believe, not possible for those more intense things to be permitted as part of zoning. However, there may be a way to put them either off site or under temporary and permanent that would not require zoning. And that stage, uh, talking about Chapter 18, the nuisance chapter. Um, I want to remind folks that noise is referenced in our nuisance chapter, but it actually exists in a separate town ordinance. Uh, that means that noise complaints are not regulated through the zoning violation process, they are regulated through the police complaint ordinance enforcement process. That said, our bylaw chapter 18 references noise um, because it's something for the DRB to think about when it's considering. Uh, permit for any activity that we're reviewing. Um, so discussing noise limits, um, residential daytime limit measured at the property line, <coughs> a maximum sound level of 60 decibels and at nighttime it drops to 50. Um, noting that just you know through internet research a dog bark can range from 70 to 90 decibels that's you noted know, the microphone search for right at the dog, um, the backyard is relatively small here. Um, so it is possible that dogs barking in the, in the backyard or in those outdoor kennels uh, could exceed the noise limit. Um, the DRB where, can, where are the joint for the ordinance? Where are the uh, decibels measured? So, for instance, yeah. if you were an adjacent property, they're measured at the property line. Okay. So, um, and the DRB could request additional information or sound study related to noise. Um, the DRB can also require noise mitigation measures. Um, this, these can take the shape of soundproofing techniques or physical barriers, although those tend to be quite uh, expensive and difficult to install. Uh, more likely, the DRB can also limit, limit operating hours. In other words, an application here conditions or requirement of the applicants to get a narrative that they commit to um, about their operation and when dogs would be in those outdoor kennels and when they would be taken inside uh, the building where you know, they're inside something that is uh, less permeable to sound. Uh, last is a discussion of mixed use properties. We don't have that. And then just very briefly on the final page before we get to the findings and conclusions. Um, outdoor lighting, um, we do have some limitations on outdoor lighting, and we just wanted to recite them here. So residential homes are limited to no more than uh, 85,500 lumens per unit, uh, 1,200 lumens or less per lamp. Sun lights greater than 1,200 lumens must be in, not higher than 45 degrees. 1,200 lumens is about what you get out of a 75 watt so lastly, um, we prepared some brief findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval for the DRB. These would be findings, conclusions, and conditions that the DRB might work off of if they were considering some sort of condition of approval of this project. Um, if the DRB deliberated tonight and wanted to direct staff to prepare a denial, staff would ask for a little more time uh, to work through that as it's a, it's a Thing we do infrequently, and it's a little bit of a different set of findings and conclusions we would need to uh, come up with. Um, lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a referral of an administrative permit, taking it through the discretionary permit process, which is, which is what our home business chapter says can, can be done and should be done, we think, in this case. Uh, following that process, 
perfectly acceptable for the DRB to ask for something like final plans, it's like this that may be reviewed prior to approval. And those could take the place of a more refined set of drawings of what's physically happening on the property and or possibly more importantly, a narrative from the applicant about how the business will be operating to avoid the impacts that the home business provisions are created to uh, deal with. So that is an option open to the DRV if you were considering crafting the conditions of approval to say, we, we would approve this, but we need these items that the approval would be based on to see those that are future. So I'm going to leave it at that. I know you have a lot of testimony to take. Happy to take questions through the chair um, as they come up. Just point to me if you want me to try to. Right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, before we proceed, um, Matt, can you explain what has taken place since the zoning violation? I'm going to call it mid-September uh, to where we sit today in early November um, relative to um, temporary event applications for these transport days. Yes. So um, following the issuance of the notice of zoning violation, um, the applicant asked to come in and speak with me and that with her to discuss the requirement to file a permit application. She did say to me, you know, I have one of these transport things already arranged, it's coming right up. What what should I do? I, you know, I want to I want to do whatever would be required, but I know the timing won't let me get through the DRB process in time. Um, and I did encourage the applicant to reach out to the town manager's office and discuss a temporary event permit. Um, the applicant did file a temporary event permit for that transport day and was granted one by the manager's office. Um, I do understand also that since then the applicant's been in discussions with the manager's office about an additional transport day, but has found an off-site location in a commercial zone for that day and be held uh, without the need for a temporary event permit and without having to put it happen in the subject. So the temporary event uh, that took place took place in the neighborhood. It did. Okay. But, but there's been some discussions about transport days happening off-site. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Donna, the floor is yours uh, to provide any additional clarity um, from the staff report. And this may be kind of a, an open dialogue with the DRB uh, and all of our members. Um, who will will uh, have have the opportunity um, to ask questions, and uh, as we as we um, gain a better understanding of your operation and uh, as it stands today. So why don't you start? So I purchased the property in 2010. When I purchased the property, I was operating, I've been operating the nonprofit dog rescue since 1998. It was one of my first questions to the realtor who went to the town to find out is there going to be an issue with this? It was brought up that I could potentially apply for a home business permit, but didn't really need it. So because I was told I didn't really need it, I went on doing what I was doing, not in a smug, arrogant, I want to piss off the neighborhood, but just I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, so I continued doing what I was doing. At some point, one of the neighbors um, started making it very clear that she was unhappy. And I went to Matt and said, I don't want to be in violation of anything. That's not who I am. It's not what I do. Is there something that I need to be in compliance with? And Matt and I talked, and, and essentially that conversation was identical. You can apply for a home business permit, but this doesn't really fit it. I'm not sure that you really need it. This is how that process works. So if you want to do it, you can, but you don't have to. 
And I thought about it, and honestly, I'm kicking myself now that I didn't do that thing that I didn't have to do because it might have made my life easier. I didn't do the permit. I thought that I was still within any acceptable boundaries of what I was doing. I'm certainly not a business that's doing anyone harm. Um, and so then, boom, I got the letter in the mail from Matt, and that started a process of conversations with him about what's going on, why have things changed, what do I need to do. Um, that then led to, I think, two complaint letters, which has exploded, as you all know, because you've seen them. Um, I stopped reading them because they were so upsetting. Um, I just, so a piece of this is no one can fix what they don't know is wrong. If someone doesn't come to you and say, hey, can we have a chat about the car in front of my yard or that van that comes in once a month or whatever it is, I cannot possibly fix that if I don't know about it. So this has quite literally been gone from one person who is a total annoyance that we sort of ignore to who ironically isn't even here tonight to an explosion of neighbors, some of whom we have adopted from us. And this has been brewing in the background. And I visit them at the end of my driveway every other day and no one says a thing to me about, hey, this is bothering me a little bit. Can we talk about how to fix it? So I am literally blindsided as all of my volunteers are by how this has, has blown up. Um, I'm not a person to do things that are in trouble. I'm trying, I'm trying to right some wrongs and do a good thing in the world and do it in a private way. I'm a private person. I don't go visit my neighbors and chit chat with them and have drinks and discuss my life. If there's something that I'm doing that's interfering with you, come and tell me. Because I have been accused of we didn't talk to us. If I didn't know there was an issue, why would I go to your house and talk to you about it? So the transport day that Matt mentioned that happened very close to all of this. Again, I called Matt because these are things I don't know and said, We've got this transport already scheduled. It's scheduled. It's paid for. It's booked. These dogs are out of need to be out of medical on this date. What am I going to do with them? Well, it was way too short a time frame to start looking for another site. And so my suggestion was I've got a fully fenced backyard. If the traffic on the road is a concern, then we'll take our volunteer cars and we'll put them in the backyard next to my camper that frees up in front of my house for parking. We will make it just incredibly clear with the doctors that they have a time to show up. And if they show up early, they forfeit their time and go away. So we have no more than three adopters at any time. And the time frame that we set was between 10 and 3. So one hour appointments would between 10 and 3, we pulled the van. And this is not a big commercial van. This is, I don't know what we call it. It's like a high-top um, passenger van. We pulled it into the backyard to get it out of everybody's view because it seems to bother everyone. So put it in the backyard, close the gate. It's safer. If a dog gets loose, they're in a fenced yard. Nobody has to see it. The van is in and out, in and out. And then we have adoptions hourly throughout the day. We took pictures that I then sent to Matt of the street throughout the day. There was never more than three cars in front of the house, and usually two. On my side of the road, in front of my house. People came, they adopted, they left. And they went and spent money in the community, by the way, which is another piece of, of this, is that they don't just stay and go. Sometimes they stay overnight. Sometimes they stay for a weekend. Sometimes they go spend money at 
local restaurants and at the warehouse. But that day, I have to say, was so smooth. We were so proud of what we did because the problem was identified and we felt like we fixed it. And then we got slaughtered on social media about how we had cars parked in my backyard and the dogs were in the backyard and the van was in the backyard and my mailbox is too tall and it sticks out too far. And it just becomes no matter what I do, there's going to be somebody that is going to complain about it. I will tell you that anyone that says that we leave dogs outside all the time, I, I, I don't know what they're drinking, but I would like some of it because I live there. And if there were dogs outside barking all the time, I would not live there. We feed at 6.30 in the morning. We don't do it. We feed at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, one volunteer usually shows up maybe a few minutes ahead of time to fill outside buckets or whatever and get things straightened out. Seven o'clock, we have a maximum of two volunteers show up in the morning. So two cars. Mine's in the driveway. Volunteers might be in the driveway and there might be one in front of the house. I wish we had 10 volunteers in the morning, but we don't. So maximum three volunteers. They show up at seven. They take the dogs out for walks. The dogs that are quiet will go back out to the, the outside kennels, but for a very brief time, they might be in a kennel for 15 minutes because the person who's walking comes back, puts that dog away, takes one from a backyard kennel, takes that dog on a walk. Um, we're done with morning by 8.30 and sometimes 8.15. So have there been dogs barking? Yes, and my neighbor's dog has been barking and the little chihuahua behind us has been barking and the golden retriever next to us has been barking and I ignore it because it's supposed to be a neighborhood. So if I have two dogs that bark intermittently between 7 and 8.30, those could be my own personal dogs out in my yard. Um, it, this thing about dogs barking constantly is just not accurate. Um, the traffic piece, I think we talked about, transport day is the big one. We're willing to, to do things to mitigate that for sure. Um, there was talk about how much square footage is in my house because on my Facebook page, I made a comment I think two years ago about how it felt like the rescue is moving farther and farther into the house. It was a comment on a Facebook page about what I sacrificed as a rescue person. It did not say that I had kennels upstairs in my living room or my bedroom or that I'm hoarding dogs. The dogs are in kennels and crates. In my, in my, um, garage, which can't be used for anything else, by the way, because as the road was raised, the driveway was raised, and there's about an eight-inch drop between the driveway and the garage floor. So it's you can never even put a car in it if you want. So it has um, portable steel kennels there in the picture. It has a line down one side of the larger Kennels and down the right side, I had a contractor build what I can only describe as a sort of wall of cubbies that small crates fit into for the smaller dogs. Um, I have a laundry room adjoining it, and I'm obviously just a laundry room to launder dog things, um, but it's also my laundry room, so it's not exclusively. Um, the, the kennels out back, I feel like I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, so stop me if, if I get confused. Um, they're portable. They're not set in the ground. They can be unclipped and moved anywhere I want to move them by a couple of people in 15 minutes. They're not on foundations. They have canvas roofs that clip onto them. They're not intended to be permanent structures. They're not used to store things. They are used to hold a dog for half an hour while it's waiting to go on a walk. 
Um, the kennels along the back um, actually are structures that I use to put my lawn tractor under in the wintertime and things like that because I don't want to buy another garden shed. So I have one garden shed, I have one shed up against the back of my house that holds things like grapes and burgers and hoses and that sort of thing. There is no specific outdoor storage for the dog rescue. Everything is, is stored within the garage. We have shelving units across the back that hold medication, bedding, food. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of the, the outdoor gist of it. So in the morning, two to three volunteers maximum, and I just ask Nicole, because she's there every day. Afternoon is the same, two to three people. And if one of those parks in my driveway, at the most, it's going to be two people that can park in front of my house for 90 minutes. I have a neighbor that's a cab driver that has eight cars in his yard all the time, and his cab is parked on the road all the time. I don't care. I really don't care. I drive around it. It's a cab. I know what he does. It doesn't bother me. Um, other neighbors, two cars, three cars, boats on their yard. Yeah, but, but tonight we're we're talking about your property. Yeah, and that is, and, and I feel like we have been painted as this. We've got one van that was donated to us by a neighbor that we used to take dump runs and take dogs to the vet. It's a Dodge Caravan. It's parked on my yard and it gets it off the street. And that is the only vehicle parked on my lawn short of my camper, which is at that. Okay, so so just to recalibrate all. Um, so tonight we're so we're here to to talk about is your is your home business compliant with the home business rules? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's really that's really what we're here to talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd I'd like the the testimony to be focused on that objective. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else for you to that you would like to add before I ask the dear or give? Uh, the DRB, go ahead to ask questions. Um, I think the only thing I just want to circle back to is the traffic piece of it. There were some letters that were sent in um, to the board with pictures. One in particular, it was a picture sort of taken from my house looking down Pine Lane toward Industrial Ave, and there was a package there that parked at the end of it. I was not outside this particular transport day, but I do know that there was a fellow who was a, a trucker from Montreal. He was coming back from New York. He asked if he could stop and pick up his dog on his way back so he didn't have to make another trip down. My assumption was, because he's a trucker, and I shouldn't have made that assumption, that he would probably park that somewhere away from our street. And he didn't. He parked it right on Pine Lane. The police were called. They talked to him. He right away moved it. Came, got his dog, and left. But it wasn't something that I was ignoring. It was done intentionally. Okay. There, there was another photo that was taken of cars lining the street. And honestly, if I had been out there, I would have been mortified because. I was in my office drafting contracts so I could get the doctors moving. What happened on that day was that transport hit weather coming up from Texas. They were about three hours behind. We had the doctors that were coming from Canada that had already left. And we just couldn't coordinate reaching people to say, don't come, we're running late. So everyone kind of converged on that one day. That was a one day. And I apologize profusely to my neighbors for that because I would have been upset about it as well. And I think my volunteers felt bad about it. 
but I just don't see any way that we could have predicted it or, or changed how it happened. It hasn't happened since and hopefully won't. So what we're looking for now is an off a regular off-site um, commercial space where we can we can do our transport days. But but I don't want that to change the fact that I I still have the kennel, I still have dogs that will be at my home. And and I will tell you that people say to me almost every day, I walk up to your house and I believe they know you have a dog. It's so quiet. I just don't tolerate a lot of noise from the dogs. Once feeding is done, it is quiet until three o'clock when volunteers show up. Um, so I guess that's all I can think of at this point. I'm obviously happy to answer them. Okay, DRB members, questions, please. So um, it sounds like you've arranged for an offsite commercial space for transport days. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that correct? We have one for our next transport day. So, so, not, our, so it's not permanent yet. Sorry. It's not permanent. It's not. I mean, we're really, really reaching out to a lot of different folks who are trying to help us find a regular place. So we have one for the transport coming next weekend and we're putting out feelers to other commercial properties looking for a place that we can use regularly because that would in my mind anyway, that would just mitigate all of the issues with the traffic. So I gotta ask, and it's not this isn't really germane to this discussion, but did you go look at where all free rescue was? Yes, it is. Actually, I went there before they even closed. Um, I called town hall, they gave me the information about the person that owned the property and called them right away. We chatted a few times back and forth over the months, and they decided that they did not want to do that kind of a venture in that building again. So I let it go. Okay. Another question I had is um, what hours? of the day are the dogs allowed to the run of the backyard? So there are only two puppies that run in the backyard together. And honestly, when they're running in the backyard, you don't even hear them. They're not barking, running, making a big fuss. They're just running around playing together. So at the end of our, let's say the end of our morning shift, maybe quarter past eight, those two puppies go out last, and one of our volunteers will be out there supervising them while they're running around and playing for 15 or 20 minutes, and then they go back in. So there are not there are not dogs, but there are never dogs unsupervised in the backyard, and there are very few dogs that even go out to run in the backyard. The dogs are are walked in the neighborhood and. One thing that I did forget to say before, if I could now, is that before all Green Rescue closed, they walked in our neighborhood, which I really don't like. But there were a lot of volunteers and a lot of big bully breeds that were walking in our neighborhood with all Green Rescue volunteers. They're closed now and have been for a while. And that just significantly reduce the amount of dog traffic through the neighborhood. So we may have, I don't know, some of the volunteers can answer this better than I can because I have mobility issues. So I'm not the person out walking dogs, but we may have three dogs walking at any given time in the neighborhood. It's not, we're not packs of volunteers and dogs all going out at the same time. The outdoor kennels are used solely for a staging area for dogs that are being walked. Dogs aren't kept in them. They are not absolutely not kept in them. Um, for instance, in the morning, the dogs that go out first are the dogs that we absolutely know are quiet. And there are, th I think, three of them that go out to outdoor kennels. And while they're in the outdoor kennels, the volunteers are walking. The other dogs that we know would be noisy if we put them outside, so we don't. Oh, okay. 
have you considered finding an off-site area for your um, volunteers to park at? It seems to be an issue. My answer is no, because there's there's two cars. It, it doesn't seem outside of what's allowed for either a residential or a home business. And it's for an hour and a half maximum twice a day. Okay. One because one of them is in my driveway and the other one or two might be parked in front of my house between my fences. I mean, if you came back to me and said that's a condition of, then we we're certainly willing to visit anything. That when I when I said we got blindsided by this, I really mean we got blindsided by this, and now we're trying to take in all the information and say, what can we do? Is it possible to still do what we do and mitigate whatever the concerns are? We're completely open to hearing whatever the suggestions are because Matt's made some and I jumped on them immediately. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, what's, what's the average number of dogs that come to the transport? So it really does vary. And I say that not to be a basic, but it varies depending on, we might have, we might think we have 20 dogs coming up. And in the last four days before transport, we find out that four of those dogs for medical reasons have been pulled off. So we might get 12 or 15. We've gotten transports that were as big as 30. And I would say on the 30 dog transport, 27 of them left that day. In fact, I think that was the day I'd have to ask Paul, but. I think the 20 set, the 30 dog transport was the one where we parked in the backyard and tried to keep things quieter. And 27 of those dogs left that day. So that day you would have had three dogs. 30 cars coming to your house. Well, it would have been out, they would have had hourly appointments and it would have been three appointments per hour. So okay. potentially three cars that came adopted left. And and how often, and I'm sure it fluctuates, but how often do the transports come typically? Once a month. Once a month. So so if if this happens once per month, what are the I mean I guess not not every time all the dogs are adopted on the same day. So are those the dogs that are at your house yes. the rest of the time? So, for instance, on the, on the 30 dog transport, there were three that didn't get adopted that day. They obviously stayed on and were adopted over the course of the next weeks. And we do sometimes have, I have a dog right now that just underwent eye surgery. So she's been with us for a few weeks. She'll leave on Thursday. It's very rare that we have a lot of dogs over a long period of time. So, so most of the dogs have been adopted before they're even at your house, and you're just facilitating the transfer of the dog. That's right. Okay. Um, questions? Uh, John, questions? Well, you guys did a great job of taking most of my questions. <laughs> um, I guess what I'm not, one thing I'm not clear on that is, is how many dogs are in a non between transport? How many dogs are typically at your house? Are they in the garage, in the yard, or in your house? So, and again, it's it's a it's a flux thing because dogs are getting adopted. Um, right now, we have two right now there are eight. One will leave. Two will leave tomorrow, and one will leave on Thursday. And that's kind of how it how it happens. That there will be eight right now, but um, that some will leave. The next, go ahead, no, go ahead. The next chance, I mean, there's no guarantee someone can come and leave a dog because it's just not the right fit. And we never push for someone to adopt. It's got to it's be the right fit or it doesn't happen. So that's the dog that comes back to the house and we go back to the books and 
And <laughs> our, our goal is never to have lots of dogs long term, but we are always going to have some dogs, either for behavior issues or health issues, that, um, or because of age, we have two senior Pomeranians right now that are not going to be as easy to place as a one year old. Great day, you know, right? So, so there are dogs that are held on to until we find the right placement for them. So, the, so is, is eight, is that a typical number or is that a kind of a high number? No, I mean, the, the kennel, the kennel can hold, we have four big, four big kennels down one side. So they're rubber matted, it's all cement for the rubber matted. Um, we have four big kennels and then this wall of cubbies for smaller dogs that we can hold for any kennel. We can hold a, a maximum in, in what we call the kennel and you would call the garage would be kennel. And considering that only four of those are big dogs, the rest are going to be dogs that are under, typically under, 25 pounds and some considerably less than that. But that wouldn't be just sort of going back to how we used to do it. We used to bring the transport in, unload all the dogs into the kennel, and we would hold them for two or three weeks and handle them and get to know them. And, and then honestly, we got tired. We found that it wasn't helping the dogs to adjust being there then moved again and that's when we changed to let's bring the transport in and rematch as many dogs as we can so they don't sit there they come in they move on and we found that that works the best for certainly for us and definitely for the dogs <laughs> um, paul any questions yeah, I got a question. When you fill out your homestead exemption, what do you declare your business use of your dwelling to be? I, I can't actually answer that because my accountant does my taxes for me. What is it? What would you know? Would you know whether it's more than zero? No, but what I'm saying is I don't know without going back and checking. Hmm. I would like to know that number just out of curiosity. Paul, well, why are you asking that question? <laughs> well, if she says that she's running a business and that she follows all the rules, then her business use of her dwelling should have a number set in it, which would reduce her tax rate. Well, I think it's a nonprofit, so there's no income. So you typically wouldn't be expensing that you could it would be tricky but i see where you're going paul I and mean, i'm curious you, you would probably know like what roughly what percent of maybe your utilities or because that's a, an expense that could be i actually yeah. the the rescue pays nothing to be in my house i pay utilities and yeah i think it's it's tricky right because it's it's not like a home office where you're you have stationary objects occupying a space you have animals that are moving around and you know, I think I lived in a 700 square foot apartment. I can't imagine having 20 or 10 dogs in that space. Um, so I think it just probably exceeds the currently, it's current use exceeds the, um, the intended use of a, of a home business, but um, maybe that could be corrected. Yeah, and, and again, you asked me what would be the maximum. That would be if the transport came in and no one took a dog. Um, I don't remember the last time that we had that many dogs in the kennel. It's typically six, seven, eight, and they're going out all the time. So it's, it's just constantly a flux situation. I would not want to keep 20 dogs in the kennel all the time. I mean, each that's not what we do. Our, our business is adopting rehabilitating and rehoming dogs. 
Okay, so at this at this stage, uh, I'd like to open up for public comment. And uh, so this is the portion of this hearing where um, if, if you are interested in, if, if you're online, you're gonna need to raise your virtual hand and, uh, and staff will, will uh, acknowledge you and allow you to participate. If you are here um, and, and uh, I believe there's an interested party there, uh, why don't you come forward? And, uh, and state your name and address for the record, please. Um, just a second. And uh, uh, so, a uh, couple of couple of uh, revisiting what I asked, and as far as rules of engagement when the hearing started, is um, is is the DRP's rule here is is not to pass judgment on um, the, the, the merits of, of the business. It's, it's is, is the business compliant with the bylaws? That's, that's really all we are trying to do here. And uh, so if you keep your comments germane to that, uh, that would be appreciated. And uh, if you would keep your comments brief, that would be appreciated. And before I yield the floor for you to introduce yourself, Mr. Riley, you had a comment? Yeah, the only comment would be, um, uh, please address your uh, comments to the board. This is not an opportunity to go back and forth um, with, with the um, with the appellant. Okay. okay, so with that, uh, introduce yourself, please. My name is Crystal Bousquet. I live at Whitney Hill Homestead for a little I've been a volunteer at the Modern English Bulldog for about one year. My question is, I believe that this tsunami of complaints um, arose based on a complaint sent by Keith Marshall, who had emailed the board members and the town. My question is, is Keith Marshall a resident of Williston? And is that actually required? Can anyone just have an email and send a complaint to a business or have a business in the town? So, uh, so Matt addressed that early, uh, early in this hearing. What's up, boss? <laughs> I do uh, have whoever, whoever's on the phone, could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Uh, okay, so Matt addressed that, that, um, that somebody from outside of Williston can, can certainly uh, raise the issue. Uh, the question just comes to whether they would be granted party status mm -hmm. if this were to go through the Act 250 process and uh, whether they would have uh, party status and the right to appeal. That's not applicable here. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's it's a moot point whether point. whether Keith is a resident or not. I don't know the answer. That's fine. Okay. Uh, somebody else have a uh, sir, if you would please come on up and introduce yourself. Um, thank you. I'm um, like Jennifer. I live in 64 Pine Lane in my white acres. And if you look at the team, this is my wife's time, and my house is here. The rest of the right across from me. Um, you know, before I talk about the project, I just want to say that out of the 68, many of the 68 comments are from neighbors in Lane White acres. They express, I think, legitimate frustrations. Um, on what's happening with the rescue, especially the transport. Every time a resident had a comment posted on the um, rescue Facebook page, there was often to say inappropriate comments about the person. You know, if you believe what you see on Facebook, none of the neighbors in the land like white dogs, none of the neighbors support the rescue, and the neighbors are. We prefer the dogs to be killed in Texas. 
then somebody made an effort to say, no, that's true. People in my life like dogs. They think the rescue is a good business. They do a good thing for dogs and for people. But maybe it's not in the right space. And, and so... Going back to what I want to look yeah, at this yeah, I understand. is, is I the, does the business, does the, the neighbors don't have to fall. Oh, hold on. Does the business meet the criteria in the bylaws? Um, That's what we're here for. So the frustrating part about that is the town has known about the rescue for years. The town manager in the in our in the violation packet, the town manager wrote a letter to an email to the zoning administrator. Hartman said, I have read complaints off and on about this location. As Don just said, she talked to Matt, who said, maybe a home business permit is needed. How would she know? How, how can business run from 2015's my starting point through 2022? How can the town get complaints about it, get questions about it, and it all, the flag is only raised on August 3rd of this year? How can that happen? I, I can't speak to that. I mean, that's, it's just not acceptable that we've gone down the road we've gone on. The neighbors are frustrated. They were talking to the town. They get crickets back from the town. You know, from, from, the, from the rescue standpoint, how is it fair to them to be doing this all along and all of a sudden? They're held accountable for not having I I can understand your frustration, but tonight we're here okay. to, so, to uh, see if the business key, is compliant. The key thing that happened with the business is it's been widely successful. I'm one of the ones who adopted a dog. My wife and I are one of the ones who posted comments to the town. We adopted our dog in 2018. I'm glad Donna explained what the process was like in 2018. They would select dogs from Texas, bring them in, they would offer them in the garage. Now, 2018, the person who was like the face of the rescue was created as town. She worked at the rescue 5 30 every morning. She would get there 4 o'clock every afternoon, Monday through Sunday. She'd walk the dogs, she'd take care of the dogs, there'd be one other volunteer helping her. Now, the dogs are there at 5.30 in the morning, not a peep out of them. So we adopted our dog in February 2018. At some point, the model changed. And as Don said, now, they advertise the dogs in Texas, people adopt them, and then they come up much larger quantity. And that's what is generating all the traffic. Back when, back when, in 2018, I don't know exactly when the model changed, 2018, 2019, I couldn't even tell you there was a rescue there. It was quiet. Sure, we'd see Karen and the volunteer, a couple of volunteers, they'd come out, they'd walk the dogs up and down the street, they often took the dogs in the backyard to walk them. I don't even, I can't even remember. So, so it now, the history lesson, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I understand. Okay. But, but my, my, my point is, is that we are, we are, and, and I start to get a little agitated when testimony is taken and, and my boundaries are ignored. You're ignoring my boundaries. Okay. So wrap it up, please. Okay. So the problem is the volume has increased. When you have more dogs, you have more traffic. Um, the problem is the house is at the T. The cars park on her side of the street. That reduces the radius of the turn. And I have seen a school bus struggle to make the turn. The cars parked at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the road. The car struggles to make the turn. The cars are on both sides of the road, and that happens sometimes. It's not a two-way road anymore. It's one-way road. Or just to, just to um, clarify, this is on transport days? This is on, no, this is on like a Monday afternoon when school bus is coming out, right? Um, cars on both sides, and that has happened during 
non transport days, cars can't go both ways. You know, the natural tendency of the drivers is part on the grass a little bit. They have to get two wheels off the grass. Well, that ruins the grass, but that helps a little bit. I mean, that's the problem. The problem is the rest of the is successful. And as a result of increasing the traffic, which goes to the PM peak hours, which goes to the noise because there's more dogs, there's more market. I mean, that's what the problem is. But the frustration is the towns in Georgia for years and years and years. The, the other, so, a lot of, so the other thing, I'm happy to hear that they're considering transport days in, in a, 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 a remote location. Because the, I have a suggestion to let's decouple transport days from the rescue and call it a special event. Let's just pick them again down the road. You're going to have the congestion. You're going to have the traffic issues. You're going to have the frustration. You're going to have the safety issues of all those cars sitting in the roads coming in on a Saturday while neighborhood kids are walking with dogs and riding bikes and all kinds of stuff like that. So you can't let trans you can't let temporary event permits be the solution. I talked to Matt about the temporary event permits. Say, hey, how not Matt, um, Eric, I'm sorry, Tom Manager, how are you going to enforce temporary event permits? You ever said to me? We don't have the ability to do that. We're going to count on the neighbors to tell us that they don't follow the criteria, which is pretty ironic since how many years has gone by and the neighbors have talked to him, nothing's happened. The only other issue I have is um, I just wonder about um, wastewater. Since this is a commercial business, doesn't it require a wastewater application? I mean, I believe there's a state permit, we still probably get away with it, but then they need town allocation. And the town allocation should be based on the number of dogs in the kennel. And if you use the state standard, the state will allocate 25 gallons per kennel. And I just wonder is there any kind of any, if you look at the um, home business application, item six, S is not wastewater. You can look at the text in there that says um, the business may need a, may need a, um, may need a state permit, which sort of state permit, and town allocation. Is, there, is that is that required for this business or not? I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so as as part of the process, the administrative permit we coordinate with the public works director, we inquire as to whether any additional sewer allocation needs to be sold in the case of any business or home that's connected to public sewer as this one is. And if there is a need for additional allocation to be purchased, we, we withhold the permit until the public works director is that sale and then sign off on our That's the main reason there's a line for the public works director to sign on our permit. And how, how does that play with the, um, what is it, amendment A, attachment A of the sewer allocation? What? Attachment A to the sewer allocation ordinance is essentially the town's yearly sewer budget, where the town decides once a year how much wastewater treatment capacity will be made available for sale to new users or expanded users across a number of use categories. So the town makes a certain amount of capacity available for residential expansions. They make a certain amount of capacity available for sale for new commercial. Uh, likely for a home business, the director would sell that out of the new commercial category. As long as there's allocation available to sell it, the ministerial act by the public works director. Uh, my understanding is there's uh, several thousand gallons per day right now of new commercial capacity available. And it changes every fiscal year. Okay, uh, next for public testimony. We've got, we've got four people on the uh, Okay, why don't we uh, let uh, Zoom participant number one in, please. Okay, so I'm going to call you in the order I saw you come up. So, uh, Elvis first. Uh, when you finish the game. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, name and address, please. Okay. My name is Elvis Barrich. I live at 218 White Birch Lane. Um, I've lived in this neighborhood since around 2010. I previously lived right next door to the rescue for about five years. My parents still live there now. Um, I purchased a house around the corner about five years ago, so I still live in the neighborhood. I walk my dog in this neighborhood every day. 
I know and I chat with a lot of the residents. So uh, I'm pretty familiar with the neighborhood. I'm pretty familiar with the uh, rescue. I think I'm probably a subject matter expert on that right now. I'll based on my experiment, experience. Um, I'm mainly here to raise my concerns about the rescue's operation in the neighborhood. I believe the rescue has outgrown the definition of a home business in Wellston, and I believe they've outgrown it by a lot. I believe continued operation, while being great for all the dogs coming up from Texas, is detrimental to our small neighborhood. It's, it's a small, quiet neighborhood. There are a lot of cars coming through here. So um, I believe the information in the application, the town staff's uh, report, failed to capture the full scale of the operation and the issues that that creates. Um, so I started by reviewing the permit application, the letters of comment, and the staff report. I have a couple of specific comments about the application. Uh, first and foremost, I believe that the rescue fails to meet Section 2, Appendix G of the Development Bylaws. Section 2, as you previously mentioned, states that the maximum floor area on a home uh, that a business can occupy is 500 square feet or 25% of the finished floor area, whichever is less. So in the case of the uh, applicants uh, provided dimensions, uh, the indoor space in the garage and the outdoor kennels, uh, it, the calculated area is about 470 square, 70 square feet, conveniently just under that 475 square foot limit for this home. Um, so looking at the layout of the garage itself, the drawing provided by the applicant shows the garage's dimensions of 14.5 by 20 feet for a total square of area of 290 square feet. And if I say anything wrong, please correct me, but um, looking at the dimensions, the 20-foot length of the garage is filled by four, that's four, four by six-foot kennels, which account for the first 16 feet in length, then a two-foot wide food prep area uh, for a total of 18 linear feet of the 20 linear feet that are called out there. Uh, all of these areas are then followed by a series of another dog crate, an aisle, and a shelving unit that supposedly all occupy the remaining two feet of linear floor length in this garage. So that accounts for the full 20 feet somehow. I don't know how you fit all that stuff into two feet to get yourself the 14.5 by 20 foot dimension. Um, maybe somebody else can speak to that a little bit better. But uh, there isn't enough information in the drawing to check for discrepancies in that 14.5 foot dimension. But seeing the discrepancy in that one dimension, I think, uh, requires a little bit more scrutiny from the Development Review Board to make sure that these dimensions are actually met. I don't believe that they currently are. Um, so uh, beyond that, uh, I believe that alone puts the rescue in excess of the allowable area of 475 square feet. Uh, if you add in the extra square footage by the neglected uh, dimensions there. Um, so next, if you look further in the application at the photos provided by the rescue, I personally noticed that there's a dog bath that is located next to a washer and a dryer and some additional storage in there as well. Uh, presumably in the first uh, floor or the basement area as well, right next to the garage. Um, the dog bath area and the laundry area to be omitted from the allowable area calculations and any of the drawings that were provided by the applicant. After seeing this and reading a public comment from another resident referencing the social media post made by the rescue, I looked up that specific post from September 11th of this year. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, okay, I, I heard somebody speak up, so I stopped. Anyways, this is the post that the applicant previously alluded to. September 11th of this year, the rescues operator specifically stated, and I quote, I have chosen to give up 40% of my home to house dogs in need. And then goes on to say, I have converted my garage to kennels and cubbies for small dogs, which is shown in the drawings and the layout, and somewhat accounted for in the area calculation, although it seems to be wrong. And then continues to say, and my once roomy renovated laundry room is the quiet room for the dogs. I think this information confirms what a lot of people have come here to say tonight. And that is that this is no longer a small dog rescue operation operating out of a 290 square foot garage and a couple kennels. It's a rescue operation that likely occupies at least the entire first floor of a home, spills out into the backyard, the front yard, and the streets of this neighborhood, greatly exceeding any allowable area for a home business. So I don't think this uh, application covers a home that meets the uh, criteria of a home business in Wilston per Section 2 of Appendix G. And then one final data point I have here is something that you folks have mentioned earlier, and that is another rescue that operated in the area, and that's Albury Rescue, another great rescue. I love the work they did. I actually volunteered there with my girlfriend in the past. We used to walk dogs down to the, uh, the park a lot of times. 
Um, they claim to have rehomed about 400 to 800 dogs a year based on the paperwork I was able to find. They did that out of a facility that is about 3,000 square feet off of Industrial Ave, as you know. Um, this rescue, oh. using a similar model of uh, kenneling and fostering, claims to do about 300 dogs out of a 290 square foot garage. Uh, all breeds had a reception area, had a quiet area, had a break room. They had an office for doing all the paperwork, and they had a large area for all the dogs that were kenneled there. So the the numbers just don't scale to me. I don't believe that this this business qualifies to be run out of the basement of a home. I love the work they're doing. I'm a dog owner. I love dogs, and it's great to see these dogs going to good homes. But it's just become detrimental to this neighborhood. <laughs> And I think a lot of the people who are here tonight to talk about this, hearing some of the, the comments from the applicant about, you know, there are never more than three cars and there's never any barking. It, it, it's hard to hear those comments and keep a straight face from my end personally. I, I, I can't rectify that with, with my, my experience living next door to there and walking through there all the time. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Zoom participant number two. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, James Bowling. I live at 521 White Birch Lane, uh, diagonally from the rescue in the neighborhood. Um, I want to state real quick that every volunteer has been wonderful. They've been polite. They've been in the neighborhood and never had an issue with anybody. My biggest concern when talking about this as a home business is that the, the rescue uses the entire neighborhood and they are walking dogs often, daily. I get it. It's a wonderful cause. I have two small children. We had one incident uh, a few weeks ago. When I mean incident, it wasn't a problem, except for the fact that as we go around the neighborhood, these rescue dogs, you know, like we have to pause and stop to let them go by because the kids on the bike distract them and they start yanking on the, the dog walkers. And to be honest with you, especially when you hear stories like what happened out of Tennessee a few weeks ago, as a father of a five-year-old and a two-year-old with some of these large breeds, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, just as a reference and to keep it short and under your parameters, uh, they're just they're using more than just that home. They're using our entire neighborhood to, to facilitate the needs of these dogs. She even mentioned it, how often they're being walked. And like, like others have said, wonderful cause. And every volunteer has been extremely pleasant. I don't have anything against them. I just, it, it's in, encrosive in our neighborhood. And, and, and to be honest with you, even our kids using the front yard, you're talking nine, nine to 15 times in an hour and a half period that large, sometimes large dogs are coming by when our kids are throwing balls and doing things that would agitate them. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you for hearing me. Okay, thank you. Um, so next one for just then. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanala Barrick, and uh, I own the property next door to the rescue um, at 192 Lamplight Lane. And I agree with the concerns voiced by my neighbors in the letters um, about the parking and traffic. And I've personally seen the parking of cars in front of my and my neighbor's properties for years. But I also want to raise and emphasize the concern of noise, specifically the continuous barking of dogs, um, which begins in the early morning hours, um, sometimes before 7 a.m. and then again in the afternoon. Um, this may last over an hour, and it's usually multiple dogs simultaneously barking, um, which would be quite the nuisance for someone like myself working from home early in the morning. Um, my bedroom window is actually only 20 feet away from the fence that divides our property. Um, the other concern I have is the outdoor storage and structures along the property line, specifically a container possibly storing uh, waste, food, or something else 
uh, in the front yard. And then kennels that may not be in compliance with the bylaw uh, or the setback rules of bylaws. Um, I believe there are five or six kennels that were mentioned in the backyard, and those should also file, follow the setback rules set forth by the town. Um, in addition, the staff report notes that the backyard cannot be used as part of the business, but during the adoption events, um, the front and backyards are used as part of the business, which is supposed to be an indoor operation mainly. Um, so the nuisance of the barking and the proximity of the structures um, to the property line is something that's really important to me and concerns me. Um, also in the staff report, it was suggested that if cars aren't going to be parked in front of the property, they could park to the north side of the actual driveway, but that area is the front lawn right next to my property. Um, and that's another concern in terms of how far away those would be from the property line. Um, as I stated in my letter that I wrote in, I like seeing my neighbors, uh, businesses succeed. Um, I've always had good interactions with the volunteers and there have not been any issues, but as long as those businesses are not disruptive to their neighbors. Thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, next one. Uh, Kristen, if you'd like to unmute this, I'm going to address uh, the Hi, thank you. Uh, Kristen Provost, I lived at 499 White Birch Lane. Um, I want to first start off by saying that I, I agree with all the comments that have been um, shared by my neighbors so far. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat those um, same comments, um, but I do agree specifically with the last three comments that were provided. I think, um, you know, the operations of the rescue are very complex and they're variable. I think at this time, they're hard to uh, manage um, uh, within the parameters of an acceptable use of a business, right? Like cars are traveling from Texas, they're coming from, you know, Canada, they're coming from various different locations. It's hard to get in touch with people if plans need to change. Um, the conditions of approval, I think, you know, uh, I think Matt mentioned earlier in the evening that the board could require a plan um, to be submitted to um, address how uh, the rescue operations would fit within the parameters of the conditions of approval. I think that would be really helpful. I don't think at this point the business can operate within these parameters. I think the 475 square footage, um, I agree with the comments from my other neighbors that you know it's use of the property, it's use of the neighborhood. Um, so I don't see how the home business could be limited uh, to 475 square feet. Um, in addition to that, um, I think, um, you know, the transport days, uh, obviously those would have to be removed off site. Um, and the parking is, it is an issue. Um, I know that um, the applicant testified that, uh, you know, there's no more than three cars and they are at specific times, but that doesn't match up with the reality that we're seeing in the neighborhood. So it is very common to have cars parked on the lawn um, on both sides of the street um, and blocking traffic and making it hard for others to use the and navigate the neighborhood. Um, so if, if it's two other conditions of approval that um, came to mind for me was in addition to the hours of operation uh, to limit the impact on the neighborhood, if the board could consider um, requiring that the dogs be walked outside of the neighborhood out onto North Grinnell as opposed to around the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, let's go. Let's let's continue with the Zoom uh, people. Uh, there's no other. No other. Okay. Uh, other people have interest in. I saw some raised hand. So come on back up. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, this is Crystal Lucey, volunteer from Wall <laughs> Street. My comment is specific to a comment raised earlier by a tenant, um, alluding to the fact that we're using a lot of sewage water or wastewater. The dog waste is captured in either food bags or um, wooden shavings that are taken to the landfill. We're not flushing dog waste down the sewer. We're doing dishes each time we're there when we clean the animals. But I would say that our water 
waste or consumption is not any more than normal average family. The dog waste does not go into the food. Okay. Thank That's you. Fine. Okay, others? Come on up, please. So, my name is a bull horse. I'm a resident of Bullchester. I'm a long-term trustee for the last years. And I just I had one question and just a couple of clarifications. So, the first gentleman on Zoom, when he was discussing the um, mention of the garage, made it sound like everything was going lengthwise, which would be what I said, going to But it's the more I said, it sounds like lengthwise, and then it goes to the So, that I think. Was an accurate way of saying. My other thing um, is that if you're going to solve your rescue, it's about like those apartments. They were a huge organization. Part of the reason that they needed the space that size is because they don't know. We don't. We've changed our model. We've matched them before they come. They're here for the day. We need to be right now for the last easily several months, if not the last couple of years. We have anywhere from five to nine months. Okay, so I have a question. Did everybody talk about PM peak hours? What part? Uh, that. So the way Williston measures vehicle traffic that's generated by a new use or a change of use is by looking up the Institute of Transportation Engineers manual. How many new vehicle trips does the vehicle either entering or leaving the premises? Are typically generated by that use during the busiest hour of the evening, Monday through Friday, between 4 and 6 p.m. So, shorthand, PMP. So, when traffic is generally busiest in Williston, is when Williston's zoning bylaw is most interested in what's happening when a new use is added. So, if, if I was really lucky, I would take out this big $600 book that the town bought. And I would turn to the page that said dog rescue, and it would say, for so many thousand square feet, a dog rescue typically adds X number of vehicle trips during the busiest hour between 4 and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, despite its high price, that book does not have that category in it. Um, and in fact, I, I looked and I, I really couldn't find a good parallel for that. So in the event that that's what happens, the DRB and the bylaw has the ability to inquire of the applicant about the nature of the operation, make their own observations, try to make some determination. Um, but when we're talking about a home business, the limit for things that I can permit over the counter administratively is a use that's going to add no more than one PM peak hour trip. In. So somebody who's doing a, a drop shipping business selling stuff on Amazon and the UPS truck comes sometime between four and six, that's it, they generated their trip. Uh, it's a very low level of intensity for home businesses to be able to be permitted administratively. As we got into our analysis of the administrative permit application here, it was a very, very high likelihood that there's more than one PM peak hour trip end being generated by that evening volunteer traffic that elevates this to development review board um, review and, and public. Just to really dumb that out to be really high. Basically, what we're saying is the PMP hours. It's the busiest hour that in that area that happens between four and six. I mean, I'm there every afternoon, seven to start three, and typically I'm in my normal. We're not typically. But I guess the last thing, the gentleman with the children in the yard is a great fight. Our volunteers are very conscientious. We walk one hour at a time. They're always on the leash. I know myself, I'm walking. I go out of my way to cross the street when I see somebody coming. Not because the dog is dangerous or is going to cause any problems, but just to get out of their way. So if he's fighting towards me with his children, I cross the road. Like, hey, how are you? And you know, draft, you know, block traffic, we don't stop. Thank you. Okay, other members of the public that would like to address the board. Hi. My name is Kim Butterfield. I'm here for a 
came to the plastic corner of the oven top. Do that. So <clears throat> for me, there was an issue this morning. And um, some people I who in particular mentioned that there was such a and um, as I wrote in my letter, it's a bit of a problem and it's gotten worse. And although I would say even years ago, the days when dogs were about all day long, um, and people I remember the dog howling all day long, and I just assumed there was nobody there, so nobody got up, apparently. And so, um, I have dogs and they do go out of the park. I try to bring them into the bed as best barking. Um, my sense is that these dogs are barking and it has changed in the last probably week and a half when we were away. It may have changed in the last month, but certainly not in the last month. Um, so there's less noise now, but I don't trust that it would last if we don't have some sort of monitoring. Um, so the barking is um, intense. It's several dogs in the morning and in the evening for an intense and lengthy period of time. Um, I have to warn my own right guests to sit in the back bedroom, <laughs> which is closest to the lawn. But they're going to be awakened in the morning, and I have I, I have to guess come right away and keep all commenting on dogs waking in the morning. Um, you know, my dogs might go out and bark a bit, but they're one or two small dogs, not one or two small dogs. And the rest. I fully support the rest of I work for the rest of the world here as a foster parent. Um, and we got a dog from, from the rest of the um, At the time, we didn't know that it was unpermitted. And I myself had a home business with a permit. And uh, until the end of it. And I was very conscious of the requirements. And times, you know, somebody might come to the house to see more to do at a time. In Parkland Street, I would ask them to park in the driveway. I certainly missed some cars at Parkland Street. But I was just a student to be graduated. Although I knew that the neighbors had to come to me and say, we're going to go to the board. And that's what I do. Um, people don't want to have backlash. I mean, too, they need to help. You want to try to keep things pleasant for your neighbors. Um, and so when I had this, it wasn't just being very gracious, it was also knowing, and maybe somehow the bottom is there. But I think there are norms in these that most everybody adheres to. And certainly we have one of those neighborhoods that we have to quiet. Friendly neighborhood, lots of dogs, lots of kids. And we tolerate a lot of, you know, friendly, lovely, delightful noise. But this business has a lot of space. And I would really prefer to see it in a really appropriate commercial space of the property. And I, I fully support it. I would even consider. Don't even in the future about the case, you know, but I really, it's just kind of to be too much for those of the neighbor. My husband and I retired, I work right out of my home and virtually. And, uh, you know, we, the noise is really interferes with our peace and quality of life. As opposed to the thing, so we kind of let it go for a long time. We thought, well, we don't have to be done here, we don't certainly don't want to. Backgrounds is not bad, um, and we tried, um, but then it became we became aware that it's really more than just part of the job. It's neighborhood life, and just business to business to business. We really appreciate you considering all of that. Thank you. Uh, other members of the public that would like to speak. My name is Ron Willis, 285 Randall. Um, I'll make it brief because a lot of this stuff has been covered, so I don't want to go over it. But um, 
One of the things that seemed to be getting downplayed a little bit, first of all, she goes to school, maybe three kids. It's three cars every morning. One gets in the driveway sometimes. There's always two cars out at the intersection at that, you know, 7 to 8 30. And at, you know, 3, 4, 5 o'clock, whatever it is, there's been on the average four in the evening. And, and they're not, you know, they just don't. I mean, unless they're going to pull up on the lawn, which I assume since you use the backyard, it's probably okay, but they don't. They park out in the street. And that's not a great intersection. It's not very wide. It's not very amicable. Um, and, and there's no way to fix it. It is what it is. But when you put two cars in it, and she happens to be right on the intersection, somebody has to be on the wrong side of the road. And, you know, there's just times when there's, it's, it's, it's a big enough neighborhood where that's a constant. There's always somebody going through the intersection. And, uh, and, and I just think we need to, it, it's just got too big for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other. Well, I just say one last thing. Anybody? The thing that keeps coming up is that we have a wrong state, and really the the model that we changed the blue transfer offsite, which we sort of talked about in our open anyway, we're smaller than we've ever been because we will have less dogs on the property, which means there's less dogs coming at any given time and less volunteers. Right. Years ago, when Dogs just come and they say, you know, we would have, we would require more volunteers to have more doctors on property at any given time, but with this is how we're set up with our doctors. As we come up from Texas, we're, if we do that for an offsite, we won't have everything. We won't have the additional 15 to 20 hours, one week a month. So essentially, our numbers may be growing the fact that we, the dogs that we're saving you know, and adopting out, but the amount Business is actually going to be conducted in my Thank you. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. So I wanted to talk to a couple of things because there, there was reference about things that I say on our Facebook page. I feel like our Facebook page is our Facebook page. It's where I interact with our supporters. I don't necessarily do it on front porch forum, although I've had people come after me on front porch forum. When I say on my Facebook page to my supporters interacting with them should not be taken out of context. If I make a comment about, oh, I just moved a dog into my laundry room. My bigger question would be is why are people stalking the Facebook page? <laughs> like I don't go, I don't go looking for trouble, but we have discovered lately that a lot of these people that have written these letters are on our Facebook page all the time, picking out things out of context, making them look in a way that they are not in front of. And I would just hope that everybody would keep that in mind that any social media does get done that way. This idea that one of the men said he felt safer walking on the streets of Bosnia than walking in our neighborhood. Honestly, I mean, I can only shake my head to that because kids come up to us. So, so again, trying to keep this within. Well, I'm talking what, about the traffic. The street. Well, but I, I I know, but I I really don't want to talk too much about social media and about what people are saying, and I want to keep it within the context of um, is the business operation that's right. taking place um, compliant with the rules and the wills and bylaws? Right. Okay, and uh, so I want to I I'm trying to stay I'm, I'm trying to give some latitude. Okay, to um, to the impact in the neighborhood that people want to express, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm trying to put some bounds on it. Right. So we do not use the whole neighborhood unless you consider walking dogs the whole neighborhood. Um, they were my eight dogs. I would still be walking them in the neighborhood. Kennels that we talked about before, they're not. Accessory storage, they're not 
They're not a garden shell, though I have one of those. These are portable dog kennels that dogs spend half an hour in in the morning and in the afternoon. There are never dogs left out during the day, ever, ever. I mean, you can come over any time of the day and not see dogs in the outdoor kennels. And there are never dogs out at night. The dogs are back into the kennels by four o'clock and we are, we are done for the day. So if there are dogs barking at night, they are not ours. Okay, any other, any other uh, members of the public that would like to address the board? Lana? Business is just that. 
and every single one of her neighbors has stopped. And it's just not fair to put all those people out. Now, I understand it's not fair to the dogs, but it's not fair to the people who live here and pay their taxes, maybe because they're having a hard time with, uh, you know, the neighbors or whatever. They, it, can, it, can, it can be um, a challenge. People have been concerned about their, um, their value of their properties. And I think that the whole nuisance of bylaws are just It's just not right to do this to the people. These are the people that live in this neighborhood. The people that have given her support. Who will say that they actually live in the neighborhood? They've all been. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other members of the public that would like to address the board? Uh, that I support the comments of the There's a huge family here that our neighbors have been gracious. There's a huge noise in the past. Uh, I concur with everyone who has said that it is just from this property. I've been a neighbor for 10 years. This has been operating without a permit, which may have been legitimate, but as the growth trajectory has changed, so has that. Maybe if in the past two years the operator went to the town of Oregon permit and that they have said, yeah, we need to. So we have to look at the growth lines for this because it's like 10 years on the ground. And I feel bad I've worked in that too. I was very actively engaged in that too as a state president in the department here. And I think there's so many. I respect the people who came out from the neighborhood and they know that there's friendly immigration and all these years just turning an eye and saying, you know what, this is annoying, it's disruptive, waking me up at 6 30 in the morning, but we go to hell. So that's been a motivating force with all the neighborhoods. Like, you know, but it's reached a point where it's in a neighborhood it's creating chaos and you know, it's not, 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 it's uh, any other members of the public that would like to address the board? Lana? I would. Uh, I would just. I no, 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 no. Uh, it, you've been right. You've you've been very succinct in your comments. I just would ask that that um, we're starting to get some repeat themes. Yes. And uh, so I, I just ask that people be cognizant of that. And that's kind of why I want to see that. Donna has lived in, you know, land by acres for a number of years. She pays her taxes, as I'm sure all her neighbors do. You may not like all of your neighbors. Your neighbor may not mow their lawn as often as you would prefer. But it seems that she's become a target for neighborhood honor or for discussion. Yeah, we have dogs who walk, but we're special. We've got cars that park in it. In appropriate spots because of the location of the home. Let's not take the personal piece. Let's look at is it a business? I know people are claiming they've been abused for years by 
are cleaned up. I'm sorry that I have to do, but it, it is a business. And I believe that she has a right to the business as anybody else in the neighborhood would have a right to do. And that's all I want. So at the beginning of the hearing, um, I said that this this is at the end of the day, this is really about property rights. And uh, and I and I remain steadfast on that. There's protection of property rights um, of the applicant, and there's protection of property rights of the neighbors. And and that is really the core issue here. And uh, so thank you. I agree with what you just said. Okay, any other public, any other members of the public that would like to address the board? Uh, ERB members, yeah, I'll get there. ERB members, uh, any other questions? Okay, he's got something to add. I just wanted to say a few last things, and that is when the issue was first brought to my attention about traffic. Um, one of the folks, the police officer, came to the house and said we had a complaint about traffic blocking wherever it was. I don't remember. And I literally walked out on the street with him, talked to him about what cars we have, when, where they park, and said, Tell me where to put cars. Tell me how do we have too many cars. We don't have too many cars. Where can they be parked? And he literally told me where they could be parked. And as long as you do not block the through traffic, it's a non-issue. So again, I went to what I thought was the source, which was the police department, who said, you can park on either side of your street. You're in front of your house, between your fence lines. Don't block the street itself, as long as traffic can go through. We're good. So I thought that we were, I thought that we were good with that. And and I just wanted to say that from a neighbor perspective, I don't think that there's anything gracious about keeping silent and then attacking someone. Because the minute that we knew there was a problem, which is why the last three weeks have been quieter, the minute that we knew there was a problem. We jumped into problem solving. How do we get things quieter? So when somebody now says to me, oh, it's been quieter, but that's probably just fake. No, what that is, is I heard you. I finally was made aware of the problem and I stepped up to do something and I'm taking flat for doing that as well. So this three-week period of it being quieter is not some kind of a facade. It's now I know the problem, and we're trying to fix it. Now we know the problem with traffic, and we're trying to fix it, and we're talking to the police department. So don't act like I'm in elementary school and I don't get what's going on. We are problem solving to make this fix. And I think that we can make it fix. Is it going to make it go away? Is it going to make everybody happy? No, it may not. But it should be able to fit into a home business picture with some conditions. And that's what we're asking for. Okay. Come out and visit. Come and, come and look at the cows. Come and look at the yard. Show up at any time of the day or night and, and then tell me that we have dogs out. I don't think it's what you're going to find. Okay, last call for public comments. Uh, come on, you, you need to come back up to the table. Thank you. I just have a question. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the process. Was it suggested to the operator that you contact um, residents within a certain distance from her property and business? I don't know if that was suggested to me. Uh, that was that wasn't something I made. No, um, there is a required provider notification that is part of this hearing process, which is a letter by mail notifying property owners who have property that touches the subject property or is directly across the street from it. Those folks do get a letter, but just following procedure for a hearing. Oh, okay. I didn't understand. 
No, there's not. No. We're suggesting because I guess part of the Outside of the bounds of okay, why we're here tonight. Yeah. That, 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 that's strictly about the hearing. Okay. That's it's just state and mandates. Yeah. Okay. Any other members of the public? Okay. I um I think what some, um what some uh, neighbors have come to find out, um, and what Susan might have been referring to was the temporary events permit, which I believe requires that um, neighbors within five hundred feet of the property that's going to hold the event. Um, are supposed to be notified, and uh, with the first one that was approved. Uh, we were not. Uh, you want to speak to that, Matt? Yeah, my understanding is that's correct. The the request was was made with not enough time for the notification to happen. The manager chose to get permit. Got it. Okay. So so noted. That that is not done by planning and zoning. It's not uh, part of the DRB oversight. But uh, but so noted. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Uh, so it's 10 04. I'm going to close uh, AP 23 uh, Thank you all. Good Yes. Uh, so we're going to go into a deliberative session now, and uh, which is which is a, basically a private session where the DRB um, will discuss everything that happened in tonight's hearing, all the other applications as well, uh, and uh, we will be um, rendering opinions. It's it's anticipated that we're going to render an opinion. Uh, that you can call planning and zoning and find out what our opinion was uh, tomorrow morning. We do have, uh, by state law, we do have the ability to, I think it's 45 days, 40, to take up to 45 days. We seldom do that. Um, I don't anticipate that we'll do that tonight. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we, uh, we have that option. Is the deliberative session like the executive session? Yeah, it is executive session. It's just, it's just, it's called deliberative session now for for some legal reason. But why isn't that an open discussion? The deliberation? Uh, I can't speak to that. Yeah. So the development review for hearing process, quasi judicial proceeding. Quasi judicial boards in Vermont are enabled under statute to utilize private delivered sessions to craft decisions uh, as it is developed for few boards and the case of ways to offer. So, is this just a decision? Is there a rationale for this? The decision includes findings of that, conclusions of law, and approval of the commission approval based on the findings. Yes. <laughs> 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 
Uh, welcome back to the Rules and Development Review Board. Uh, it's 1055 on Tuesday, November 8th, 2022. Uh, is there a motion for DP 21-18? Yes. That is authorized by WDP 6.6. Three items on normal guide with the Wilson Development Review Board. Have you reviewed the application submitted in all company materials, including recommendations of the town staff and the advisory board is required to comment on this application by the Wilson Development by law? And having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 8, 2022, authorize EP 21 18 to proceed to residential road management allocation. Thank you, John. Is there a second? All second. Okay, thank you, Nate. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John Hamilgarn? Yay. Scott Riley is refused. Uh, Nate Andrews? Yay. Uh, the chair is a yay. Uh, four in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Uh, is there a motion for DP 23-03? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll make a motion. Here we go. Um, okay. Um, uh, as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, Scott Riley, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted, and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory board, required to comment on this application by the development, Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 8, 2022, accept the recommendations for DP 23-03 and authorize this application to move forward to growth management. Uh, thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Thanks. Uh, John Hamilgarn seconds it. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John? Yay. Scott? Yay. Nay? Yay. There is a yay. Five in favor. None opposed. Motion carried. Is there a motion for DP 23 04? Yes. As authorized by WPP 6.6.3, I, Nathan Andrews, moved that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 8, 2022, Accept the recommendations for DP 23 04 and authorize this application to move forward to growth management with the following modifications to the recommendation of the motion. 2B will be uh, stricken in its entirety and replaced with for option 1B, show the access drive located outside the side yard setback on the site plan. The DRB and staff prefer option 1B. Okay, thank you, Nate. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Scott seconds it. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John? Yay. Scott? Yay. Nate? Yay. Chairs are yay. Five in favor. None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, is there a motion for DP 23-05? 
That is authorized by WDB 6.6.3 by John Hermelgaard and Moses Wilson Belt Newport. Having reviewed the application submitted in all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory board required to comment on this application by the Wilson Belt Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing on November 8, 2020. Accept the recommendation for DP 23 05 and authorize this application to move forward to discretionary permit review. We're going to add a recommendation number four that says the applicant shall include within the private driveway's design a lane designated for pedestrian slash bicycle. Thank you, John. Is there a second? I'll second. About seconds it. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, yay or nay, Paul? Yay. Yeah. John? Yay. Yeah. Todd? Okay. Nate? Yay. Yeah. Chairs are yay, five in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Uh, is there a uh, motion to approve the minutes of October 25th, 2022? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of October 25th, 2022 as written. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Second. Uh, John Hamilton, in second. Any discussion? Uh, yay or nay? Uh, Paul Christensen. Yay. John Hamilton. Yay. Scott Riley. Yay. Chairs are yay. Five in favor. Not opposed. Any other business to bring forth for tonight's DRB? Very good. Yeah. And you said. The next meeting is two weeks, is November 22nd. That's the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. I was taking a while, yes, but I, I think that's it correct. Is. It is. I just want to make sure that we got a quorum in there because it becomes a travel. That's a travel. That is possible. I may not be here for that. Um, I think I got to go to Boston. Okay. okay, John, what's your status? Uh, not leaving until Wednesday. So you're here. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the date again? It's uh, Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. I'll just have to do a remote. Do you remote? Yeah. Okay, I'm here. So we have an agenda. RCD for that. Yeah. DW's relationship with Ireland's development arm. Right down to the nub. Only have four. So I don't know. Let's just do it now. So we're going to have to be careful about four. So. I mean, the 15 days is next Monday. It'll be strengthened to come up. I think they're going to be quick and brief. I just, I just don't feel ready right participating in Ireland. One. Our relationship with their with Ireland's development arm has grown. Yeah, and in twenty nine, I've got. So I mean, Paul, you make it. Yeah, Paul, are you available? On oh Tuesday yeah, I'll be here. Friday? Okay. So we just have to check with Dave. So, Andrew, if you could reach out to Dave Turner, make sure he's around. I uh, do a, uh, do a, like, figure out who's around. Okay. So okay. Who's on Grazer? Who's the old dude? Jill. Oh, Jill? Nice surprise. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
Thank you all. <laughs>